Well, I'd like to convene our meeting here, call the order of the October 2021 Committee on Accreditation meeting. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almos. Cynthia? I think she was having some technical problems. So yeah, we uh, might want to circle back to her. Yeah. Jamaline Bulatayo. Here. Kathy Kresha. Kathy. You're muted. I am muted. Apologies. Here. Katrina Chikowski. Charles Forbes. Here. Bob Fraley. Here. Mike Hillis. Here. Lynn Larson. Here. Marty Martinez. Here. Jason Lee. Here. Gerard Morrison. Yep. Kevin Taylor. My apologies, Michelle. I'm I'm <laughs> here as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Great and excellent. Thank you. And thank you again with us so much, uh, committee members, for joining us once again. It's been a while, so it's good to see you all. Uh, thanks in advance to the staff for your preparation, as always. It's stellar in, in getting us ready for the meetings and all the detailed info. Uh, and thank you, those of the community who are joining us. Uh, this is a reminder we are going to be conducting this meeting entirely virtually. And just a few things before we get started. Most staff and members are participating from their own locale, and a few may be in the commission office. The Zoom link has been made available to the public. Regarding Zoom identification, we'd like to ask that everyone check their Zoom ID and make sure it contains your first and last name accurately so we're able to call on you appropriately and also so that we get all the names accurately recorded in the record. If you need to update your name, click on the three dots in the window with your picture to bring up the rename option. When it comes time to take up an item, we will need a moment to bring the appropriate attendees into the main meeting room and make sure that they can see and hear the committee and that we can see and hear them as well. Participants will need to turn on their camera and also unmute. Regarding the use of microphones, to the committee members, we're going to mute your microphones as always to eliminate any background noise that may get in the way of others hearing what is being said by the speakers. We ask that when you speak, you unmute yourself, but then please, once you are done speaking, go back to being muted. Regarding commenting or asking questions, committee members, if you wish to make a comment, as a reminder, please either physically raise your hand on camera or use the raise hand feature, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And myself and others will be looking for the raising of the hand, so if we don't call on you and immediately, please know we are scanning our screens to be sure we get everybody. So if you're unable to do any of those options, you can also send a message in the chat feature in order to signal that you have a question or a comment. Several of us will be looking for those with comments or questions in the chat as well, and the raised hands, but just be sure if we miss you and you have something to say that you, we do get back to you and call on you. Because you are a public body and must conduct our business in the public forum, we ask that you please do not use the chat feature to make substantive comments or have discussions on any items. Public attendees of this meeting cannot see the chat box, and those who view the video archive of the meeting will not have access to any of the conversations within the chat. Procedures for motions and roll call vote. When you make your motions, please state the motion in full, so there's no question as to what the motion is. All votes will be conducted via roll call. Just before the vote, we'll remind everyone to make sure you are unmuted so we don't miss anyone's vote. If you are unable to respond via video or audio, you may make your vote known through the chat function. The secretary will have to read your name and your vote when she gets to that part of the roll call vote to make sure it is an official part of the record and so the public knows what the vote is. Because this can't be quite cumbersome, we want to leave that as the last option. Members, if you need to leave the meeting for any point of time, please raise your hand and let us know so we can sure that we have a quorum at all times and so we can maintain an accurate record. Also, please do the same once you return to the meeting. Regarding public comment, members of the public wishing to provide public comment during the discussion of an agenda item will be given the opportunity to speak during the public comment period for each item and then at the end of the meeting. The committee chair will announce when the public comment period is open during the presentation of the agenda item and ask for anyone who wishes to comment to notify the meeting moderator as explained below. To those participants via Zoom webcast, 
Individuals who join the meeting via the Zoom webcast will need to click on the raise hand icon to indicate that you would like to speak on the item. Staff will notify the individual when it's their turn to speak by calling their Zoom ID, and that would be the name used by the member of the public when logging into the meeting. At that time, the individual will be prompted to unmute their microphone and will be able to share their comment. And just as a reminder, the Zoom ID name used by the member of the public to join the Zoom meeting will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. To those who are participating via teleconference, individuals who join the meeting via the U.S. toll-free number will need to press star 9 on their phone to inform the meeting moderator that they would like to speak on the item. The meeting moderator will notify the individual when it is their turn to speak by calling the last four digits of their phone number and will allow them to unmute their, their telephone. At that time, the individual will be prompted to press star 6 and will be able to share their comment. There is also a time designated for general public comment at the end of the meeting. And as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Once the meeting has ended, the archive audio and video will be made available via the Commission's website. Do any committee members have any questions about these protocols? Okay, pretty standard and familiar at this point. So let's move on to item two. The first item is the approval of the October 2021 agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for the October 2021 meeting? And please remember to unmute your microphone when you speak. I move to approve the agenda for the 2021 meeting. Thank you. So we'll move by committee member Lee. Is there a second? Second. Second by member Cracia. The secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Almos. Aye. John Malin Bolatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Gerald Forbes. Aye. Bob Friendly. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. And uh, you, motion we, until we skip me as well. Did I skip you? Sorry, Marty. Aye. <laughs> now it officially carries. Thanks, Marty. Moving on to item three. Item three is the approval of the minutes of the prior meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 2021 meeting? And as a reminder, it'd be appropriate for any committee member who was not in attendance at that meeting to abstain. But first, are there any member of the public who wish to make a comment on the item? All right, seeing none, is there a motion by a committee member? Member Larson. I move to accept the meeting minutes from August. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Second by Member Hillis. So, so moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Any changes or corrections to the minutes themselves? All right, seeing none, the secretary, please call a roll call vote. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Jomeline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Abstain. Bob Franley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Jason Lee? Abstain. Gerard Morrison? Abstain. Okay, motion carries. At that point, do we have enough? I guess we do, to everybody who voted would be present. It's not so much as a quorum at that point, but it's all, the motion carries. Is that correct? Yes. Just for procedural? Okay. All right, let's move on to item four. Item four is the co-chair and members report. Any members have anything they wish to share? A slow couple of months. Everybody just glad to be back and moving along. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll just say from, from my perspective, uh, it's been nice to see the students again face to face. We haven't done that for a while, so I'm sure you can all kind of relate to that. A little bit of apprehensiveness maybe at first. Um, I'm unsure, but things have settled in nicely. So it, it really is good to do that. Just connecting with them has been wonderful. I look forward to the time when we can actually recognize the faces um, without the mask. That's been a bit of a challenge. So, uh, but I'm looking forward to that moment. Hopefully it's coming soon. 
Okay, well, let's move on to item five then. Item five is staff reports. And there are several yeah. updates today from Ms. Hickey, Ms. Sullivan, and possibly Mr. DeGeer. Uh, Ms. Hickey, would you like to begin? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy to see everybody this morning. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things. We won't take a real long time this morning. I, I know I say that all the time, and then we do, but... Um, so this may be possibly our last virtual meeting as a committee on accreditation. We don't know. Um, the, the governor um, approved um, legislation that allowed this extension of the public bodies to hold meetings via um, technology through January, of 20, of January 30th of 2022. We know our next meeting is February 3rd and 4th. It's right after the, the extension ended. Um, but we don't know what the governor plans to do. So we are um, anticipating and trying to plan for an in-person meeting. Um, and we will just watch. And as soon as we know what we're, what the governor wants us to do, we will make sure to let you all know so we can um, have that plan. I, I'm hoping that it comes earlier rather than later so we have time to plan sufficiently. Um, but um, yeah, so that's where we are with this. Um, we do know that one of the things that will probably stay as a result of all of this will be um, continued access for the public via technology. Um, it, clearly, we were able to um, find the technology and put in place the technology so that members of the public and institutions can participate via technology. And we suspect that that will continue to be the case with all public bodies in the future, since we are able to do that now. We have done the, that portion of it for a long time with institutions. I, I think COA is sort of ahead of the curve in terms of allowing institutions to participate via technology. We've been doing that for a few years now before the COVID situation. It saved a lot of money um, for institutions not to have to travel to Sacramento so um, and team leads and that kind of thing. So, so that's where we're at with that. Um, and we, we will let you know as soon as we know. So, and again, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, our site visits have started for the year. We wanted to report to you that we have noticed um, a pretty substantial decline in number of participants in, um, uh, in interviews, and that's posing a challenge for our um, site visit teams. We are kind of doubling down with our consultants and institutions, trying to tell them, please try to do everything you can to get people. We know that everybody is stretched to the limit. People are substituting. We're hearing that county offices are substituting, um, that you know, district office people are substituting. Everybody is sort of jumping in on the substitute issue. And so people are really stretched to the limit. But um, it is posing a challenge for our teams to try to make decisions when they only have, you know, so many candidates or so many people, um, it, you know, being able to be interviewed. So I just wanted to let you all know that as a backdrop for this current situation. We didn't have that challenge as much last year for whatever reason, but this year it's certainly starting to be an issue. The other thing I wanted to just talk about was, and, the, and I'll let my colleagues mention, is that we have really been spending a lot of time on the changes that were put in place on AB 130. Um, so AB 130 was the budget trailer bill that was pretty, is a ginormous bill. It had lots of things in it. It had the grants that Kara will mention and give you an update on. Um, it has the COVID flexibilities. Um, and one of the things with the COVID flexibilities, so you will probably all recall, because I think we reported this in August, that it extended the um, deferral of the TPA and APA um, examinations to the clear if the conditions were such that a candidate cannot take it. And, you, and that was, there are four specific conditions in which um, the governor set forth in order for that to be deferred. We know that there are over 12,000 candidates right now in induction that have not passed the TPA or APA, and that is causing issues for our induction programs. So we are really trying to reach out to institutions to say, do not move these people on um, if those conditions are not there. The conditions are set in law. And so we put out a PSA last week to remind institutions, preliminary programs, of what those parameters are around whether a candidate can have that deferred or not. And then the other things that we've been working on a lot are the long-term policy changes around basic skills and subject matter. And basic skills, I think we updated you in August. So I, that seems to be going fairly well. Of course, there are issues that people are identifying, um, my, minor issues, but I think for the most part, they're all fixable at some point. 
um, the subject matter is a big is a big change for people, and um, it is a pretty big policy shift. And people are starting to begin to learn what it all means and how to implement it at their um, at their campus level. Um, we did hold an, uh, a webinar a couple of weeks ago, well, actually last Monday, a week ago Monday, um, for institutions. Um, and we are continuing to work uh, really closely with the field to try to understand what the issues are and try to problem solve around them. Um, and the regulations packet, David is working on to go to the commission in December that will um, add some additional specificity when it comes to um, implementing the subject matter requirements. So um, just as a reminder with the subject matter requirements now, there are additional options. So the CSET exam still remains an option. The sub completion of a subject matter program still remains a viable and an excellent option. Trying to make sure that we underscore that is it's a really important um, viable pathway. Um, but then the additional ones are an, um, an academic degree in the exact match with the credential area. So a math major um, will have been deemed to have gotten um, or met subject matter um, for you know, the math credential, um, those kinds of things. And then um, the coursework um, option where we are, an institution can evaluate a person's coursework based on the, the subject matter requirements and determine that they have met um, or have demonstrated the subject matter requirements. And then a mix and match of um, certain CSET exams with the, or subtests with the coursework that is aligned to the um, subject matter requirements. So it's a, it's a lot, I think, for institutions to take in, for credential analysts to process, for faculty to understand. Um, and so we've been working closely with the field and we expect that that will continue at least for the next you know, six months or so as we work all of this out. Um, and make sure that we uh, are able to understand the implications of this work. Um, we will be um, drafting, we have to revise the preconditions that go along with these things. Um, we will probably bring that to your next meeting just to talk through with you and get your feedback um, to make sure that we are uh, going in the right direction with that. But we do, we will probably present that to the, that's the commission's authority. So we will present that to the commission either at the February meeting or their next meeting in terms of what changes need to be made to the preconditions related to subject matter. Um, basic skills, I don't think there are many changes, if any at all, to the preconditions. It basically says you're checking to make sure that the, pre that the basic skills are met before you um, complete. But, but we need to really do a, a we're doing a solid analysis of, of where all those changes need to take place. Um, and then the other thing is um, Aaron and I and others are looking at what accreditation processes need to be put in place. Are we going to ask for anything different through common standards or, um, or any of the program standards during either program review or common standards review or the preconditions? So we've got the accreditation pieces of it, which is what we'll also bring back to you um, at a future meeting to talk through what those processes can be and what kind of documentation we would require. So that is it for me. Marty, sure. you have a question? Yeah, I, yes, I, and thank you for all of your work on that. I know it's a lot. Um, you know, some of the questions I know that are coming up for institutions um, is, is really around the, um, the evaluating of transcripts to determine subject matter knowledge, um, because that's kind of a new role for, especially for, um, I think it's always, my understanding, it's always kind of been in the hands of, a, of the IHEs versus the um, like county offices or districts. And so, I know you're just de beginning to develop a plan, but is there a plan to, to train and, and, or, you know, we were trying to figure out as an institution how we're going to, to manage that or what it mm -hmm. might look like? I think we definitely need to think about the technical assistance involved here over the next few months. Um, we have been talking about that. Um, it, might, it may be a uh, matter of bringing programs together to talk amongst yourselves because you, you know, you're like in individuals and have like roles. So that might, might be helpful, but yeah, certainly that's part of the, um, the thinking. Um, it's taken us quite a while to, to, we had, to, we went through the um, emergency regulation process, got some feedback from the office of administrative law. And so we had to make sort of um, a few changes in that respect. And so um, um, yeah, I think technical assistance will be an important part of what we're doing. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, sure, I, I just looked and there's an awful lot of smoke outside my house. So um, 
I might just run outside just to check. And if somebody wants to, um, Kara, I know you wanted to mention something about the, uh, just where we are with grants. So I'm gonna, I'll be right back. Yeah, check on that, Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> and then I'll pass it over to Erin after this, I think. Um, so good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Maybe we'll be seeing each other in person. Um, I think in August, I gave you all an update on the grant funding that has, uh, was in the AB 130 that the governor signed. And I'm very happy to say that today, I'll just mention briefly that we do have RFAs in process. They are being written even as we speak. And we have a tentative timeline uh, for disseminating and releasing RFAs for the one, two, three, six different grants we are um, administering with, I, I've been calling it a team of one. We do have a grants consultant who most of her job is grants. However, uh, she has other responsibilities as assigned as we all do, of course, Christina Naharo. And then we also have the wonderful Iore Asamwani and uh, a portion of her is classified grants. And then I help as, a, as I can. So um, we are fast and furiously doing our best to get these RFAs out the door. So coming hopefully next week, it's, uh, what's going through one final review is the teacher residency capacity grant. And um, last week at the CCTE, I talked um, a lot about the partnership of IHEs and LEAs around capacity grant and getting together for this particular um, grant funding. Um, last time in the original teacher residency grants uh, funding from 2018, we only had 1.5 million for capacity building. And this time it's 25 million. And so um, grant opportunities up to 250,000 for these IEG um, and uh, LEA partnerships to really plan and support each other around the potential of a teacher residency program. So that particular RFA, if all goes as planned, will be released next week. Um, following that particular RFA will be the teacher residency expansion grants. We have many teacher residency programs who receive funding from the initial go round from federal funds, they have received, they've, they've just been working in California. And so the expansion grant opportunities in RFA will be released uh, following that. And we're hoping uh, by the end of this calendar year, crossing fingers. And then following uh, early two, uh, 2022, I can't believe it's already 2022, will be what we call the regular teacher residency grant. So it's open to anyone who is uh, interested in that partnership between an LAA, LEA and an IHE and creating that teacher residency program. So those are the big ones. Classified school employee teacher credentialing program, we're hoping the RFA will be out again by the end of this calendar year. That's our plan. Um, Computer science incentive program, I uh, have to say it's been a little bit farther down on our list uh, because teacher residency and classified, I know people are chomping at the bit. So we are, we'll keep you posted on that particular one. And then the last one is the dyslexia grants to preparation programs. And uh, we have the wonderful Roxanne Purdue who's helping out with that one. And uh, that RFA will hopefully be released early 2022. So. That's the update. I see Cheryl's back and it's over to Erin. Yes. Thank I'm you, back. Kara. Oh, go ahead, Cheryl. No, no go one ahead. Really I was going to turn it over to you, Erin. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. But everything's good. Yes, everything's Great. fine. Good. Um, so good morning, committee members. It's nice to see you. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, we have kicked off officially our, um, our site visit year. This is year six, which is site visit year for the Violet cohort. Um, in the Violet cohort, we have 34 institutions that we will be conducting site visits for. In addition to those 34 regularly scheduled cohort site visits, we also have four provisional site visits for new institutions in the IIA process. Those are all occurring this fall. Um, in fact, uh, we've done two of them already and the other two will happen in November. Um, and then we have three revisits that will happen this year, and those are all scheduled for the spring. So since early October, we have had seven site visits, uh, and we will have five more before the end of the year. So yay, staff. 
Um, there, things are going really well. Uh, of course, we're still doing virtual site visits um, and, and everyone's working really well, of course, with the exception of just whatever is causing the lag in, um, in attendance for, for the uh, interviews, which really could be a myriad things at this point. Um, in addition to doing site visits year six for the Violet cohort, this is also year five for the Indigo cohort, which is the year prior to their site visits for those institutions. So in year five, institutions have to submit program review in the fall and common standards review in the spring in preparation for their site visits that will occur in 2022-23. We have 31 institutions in the Indigo cohort, so um, just a few less than Violet. Uh, that includes 12 IHEs and 19 LEAs. Across all of those institutions, we have 150 total programs that need to be reviewed as part of program review. And that is combining multiple single as we, as we typically do. Um, I, that 150 count is also not disaggregated by pathways. So if institutions have a multiple single program um, or a SPED program that includes both a student teaching pathway and an intern pathway, again, those are, those are combined in my count there. Um, we have 18 program review sessions scheduled between October 26th. So we held our first one on Monday between October 26th and January 14th. Six of those this year are SPED only. Um, that is because SPED programs are all transitioning to the new standards. They have to Im uh, implement those new standards by July 1. So for the Indigo cohort institutions, we ask them to submit program review for their ed specialist programs this year to the new uh, ed specialist program standards. So we're, um, we're holding those program reviews separately so that we can do some um, very targeted um, calibration for those reviewers and have um, our wonderful ed specialist um, subject area consultants, William Hattrick and Sarah Solari there so we can really support those reviews. Obviously everything isn't in place. So they're gonna be unique program review submissions that contain kind of a combination of both current um, authentic pieces of evidence and some things that are forward looking. Um, that won't really be in place until the site visit. So they'll be a little bit unique in that, uh, in that case and the feedback will, um, will uh, be able to address those um, unique qualities of those programs. Um, in addition to those six SPED only, because uh, all institutions are required to transition by July 1, all of the, to the new SPED prog uh, program standards, sorry, um, every institution that has uh, an ed specialist um, program has to also submit a plan for uh, implementation. So um, Indigo cohorts doing program review, they don't have to do the plan for implementation. Everyone else is submitting a plan for implementation. Those are due by October 31st. And um, those are kind of a mini program review. They took some components from program review, just a few sort of very targeted components and asked institutions to respond to those. Um, and of course, we have to have those reviewed as well by our wonderful peer reviewers um, with the guidance of Sarah Solari and William Hattrick. So we have seven sessions this fall that are just for reviewing the plans for implementation from those institutions and providing them with feedback. Common standard submissions, as I mentioned, are due for Indigo cohort in the spring. <clears throat> those are due uh, February 28th. And we will be announcing in the PSDE news this Friday, a common standards um, office hours that will be held on November 9th. So two weeks from now, um, we'll have a two hour office hour session because I know institutions that um, they've gotten those program review submissions in and they're already thinking about common standards. So we'll have a, we'll have a two hour office hours. Michelle Bernardo and I will host that to try to start to talk to institutions about um, the common standard submissions that they're preparing. And then in addition to all of that, um, if I can just kind of keep tooting staff's horn, um, staff continues to host uh, bi-monthly uh, office hours for a variety of subject areas, including multiple single subject programs, intern programs, um, special ed and PPS, because of course PPS programs are also in transition right now and they have to implement their own new standards on July 1. 
um, induction programs, early childhood education, and of course, our, our performance assessment folks. So at least twice a month, we've got office hours for all of, for that variety of subject areas, in addition to the other outreach um, that we're doing around, as Cheryl mentioned, subject matter and basic skills. So um, we are fast and furious at work, hopefully supporting the field um, as much as we can right now. Yeah, so obviously, you know, I, I, we can't stress how great our staff is. <laughs> <laughs> um, just really working hard and, you know, no breaks during this COVID time, as I know all of you are, there's no breaks, but they really have been working um, really, really hard and doing a fantastic job. David has now officially been with us six months. So David, do you want to say anything? Um, so he's thoroughly in, in, entrenched in uh, CTC work now. Oh, and sure. I see a couple of, I see a couple of hands. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So whatever way you want to take it, Cheryl, if you want to answer some questions. Lynn, I saw your hand first. Remember Larson? Go ahead, Lynn. Um, I just wanted to express my institution's deep gratitude for the office hours and for the tremendous efforts. Um, we're in the Indigo cohort. <laughs> so um, it's an interesting time for us as an institution. And those office hours have been invaluable for our associate dean to attend and ask questions and hear from other institutions. So um, I know it's an additional ask on, on staff's time at an extremely busy time, but it's, it's just been really invaluable. So I just wanted to express my institution's gratitude. Thank you. Cheryl. And member Forbes, Cheryl. Well, that was essentially what I wanted to say. Lynn just got her hand at first, but um, as a member of the Violet <laughs> cohort and a university program <laughs> sponsor, um, I, you know, if it can be one outcome of the pandemic that helps move the work forward, I don't know in the future if it will be an extra um, duty for staff, but it's been so incredibly valuable. And I think also helping the, like, say, for example, our credential analysts to sort of manage their anxiety as these new, <laughs> mm -hmm. as these new um, and very positive um, pieces of legislation, for example, move forward. And so they know like, okay, we can talk about it during office hours. And it just yeah. takes off some of the pressure, even in the absence of immediate responses or answers. <laughs> And yeah, that's, thank you. Yeah. Cheryl, you were probably about to say the same thing. I think that it, it really goes both ways mm -hmm. um, because it also gives us an opportunity to hear from you. And sometimes things come up and we have to circle the wagons here in the office and say, hey, we're hearing something. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice because we're hearing it. Or we're hearing it early. If there's something that we need to do or if there's something that's going on with all of you, we're hearing it early as opposed to when we didn't have these bi-monthly, you know, opportunities to touch pace, we might not hear something um, until, you know, for a few months. Um, so it's, it, it really goes both ways as communication has been uh, equally as valuable for, for us and our staff. Yeah. I was just going to say the same thing. It's absolutely essential. And also I would say that um, it cuts down on our workload in some respects because there isn't the back and forth of the emails and not understanding what the question is. You can talk it through and talk it out and think it through together. And then other institutions are able to give their input about, oh, no, here's what we do. Um, so it's been really, really helpful, I think, on both sides. So I agree, Erin. So David has been with us for six months. David? So uh, in addition to the fundamental changes uh, that Cheryl talked about earlier with how we now look at uh, the way candidates demonstrate their basic skills, and their subject matter competence. The state budget also included a plan to transition to universal transitional kindergarten by the 2025-26 school year. It is estimated that this will require an additional nine to 11,000 new teachers just for TK. Uh, and in August, uh, staff proposed to the commission um, some different pathways to help get people um, ready to do that. And part of it would be to retool the existing early specialist, early childhood specialist credential uh, and have different pathways to that credential, both from a, a multiple subjects credential and from a child development permit. So uh, we are working very closely with the uh, California Department of Education, with the school boards, um, the, the State Board of Education and other partners on this. It's gonna be a multi-year project and uh, really looking forward to this can really make a difference for California. Mm -hmm. 
And then one last policy issue, um, um, SB 488, which, which was um, a bill that basically says to um, phase out the existing RECA and to move it to a performance assessment um, foundation. So we'll be working a lot on that over the next few years. I believe the date on that, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, is 2025, is that right? Yep, July 1st, 2025. Okay, so, so we will be working on that. We have, have in anticipation of that, we've been doing some kind of groundwork of pulling you know, documents together and, and research together around all of the things that are related to literacy in California. So those items will be going before the commission in the next, you'll see, you'll see several of those over the next few years. As we I just, um, <clears throat> I wanted to point out that I just noticed that Kathy's hand is up and Kathy, oh. I'd like to let you know, your hand is very hard to see with your background. I didn't notice it until I looked at the panelist list. So you might have to really advocate for yourself and not get skipped over today. <laughs> okay, good to know. And yes, yeah, you're right. It's blending in with the fall colors. <laughs> awesome. I um, just also wanted to say thank you um, to the staff for all that you've done. You know, we just finished up our site visit. I didn't get to attend the webinar on um, the basic skills and subject matter, but I did kind of view the, um, looked at the PowerPoint and, you know, all the things that are coming up. And I just wanted to thank you for those office hours and I will be, happily attending the, the future ones as, as I can. Um, and just also thanks to the staff for, you know, for all that you've been doing, because it's crazy out here, you know, being a credential analyst, <laughs> it's just insane. Um, yeah, and I'm just hoping that we can get some information on how to document, because now I'm really concerned about how to document all these candidates as I'm entering their, you know, trying to enter recommendations, because they've all heard it. And so they all know, and they're all like, Hey, I can get my credential now. <laughs> so it's like, ah. so thank you for all that you do. And I appreciate it. Great. I think that's it for us. Okay. Well, thank you uh, staff for doing that. Um, just a comment about raising hands. It might be easier if we have an extended conversation, so you don't have to have your hand up the entire time. Just go ahead and press the raise hand feature in the chat it might make it easier. Um, just a couple questions. I think the information is always is greatly detailed and you guys are always working above and beyond expectations. Um, regarding the coursework satisfaction, I know for the subject matter, um, for the, the was as one of the four options, mm -hmm. is it going to be determined by discipline and, and how will that information be relayed to the institutions for them to make, like, to, like, are there, will there be set guidelines like there are within the um, SMPP with that preparation program that they will have to meet within their coursework, but rather than submitting it, they'll just have to do internal approval? That's that's generally correct. So the, the subject matter requirements are, um, are already kind of established. They are, um, they are the content area, um, content specifications, basically, that the CSET exam is built on and the subject matter programs are built around. So they are, we have a document on the website for the demonstration of subject matter that outlines at the domain level, not at the element level, because they get very, very granular. Um, and subject matter programs have had to um, address all of everything that's in a subject matter re um, requirement. So that it is by discipline. So you'll see one for music, you'll see one for math, you'll see one for science, mm -hmm. the various sciences. Um, and the institution can use these documents or has to use these documents to determine whether the coursework align that the candidate has taken aligns and covers the content of those domains. Um, and so that the, the, you're right, the difference is you won't be submitting those that evaluation to us. You will make it, mm -hmm. as an institution be making that determination and, and deciding whether or not the coursework that that candidate has taken is aligned. Now, you know, we have been talking with institutions to sort of, if they can, as they do this coursework evaluation to make sure to keep track of that so that, you know, if the, the next candidate who takes that exact same course, you've already done the evaluation for that, that, um, that course. So you already know it's aligned to this domain or that domain or several domains. So it's complicated work um, and it mm -hmm. probably most likely would take a content expert in those areas to understand. Um, so um, we are strongly encouraging uh, that content experts be um, included in those, those coursework evaluations. Um, 
Yeah. And so it's, and, and we'll have to work on, um, you know, the piece that we're, we need to work on is the consistency across institutions and the consistency of how you look at that subject matter, those subject matter requirements. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's going to be but you're right. ongoing. It trial. is on, on a yeah. content by content basis. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. The other thing I just want to mention, and I'm sure many of you already recognize this, is that with the TPAs, um, I'm involved in the TPAs, but part of the process is we found a significant reduction in the number of TPAs submitted in the fall here uh, from, for all subjects, and that we're expecting that come the spring, um, there's going to be an abundance of them. So if, if you are aware of anybody or yourself are interested in, in being trained to be an assessor, I would say you reach out to the CTC and there's always information on the PSD news that comes out every Friday. Um, or you always check the website. And I think is Amy Rising still in charge of that area? She's overseeing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say reach out to her and she can kind of give you some guidance as to where to go from that. Um, but I know we're always looking for people who can be involved. Uh, and it's worthwhile activity, even if you are advising students you can still do that uh, as, as an assessor you just can't assess any from from your institution um but i think it's worthwhile work and, and i've been doing it for four years now and it's it's really interesting i think it's fascinating and you get a chance to contribute to what's going on in the, in the overall development of the process to help prepared educators but just letting you know again the numbers are low now big numbers expected in the spring so now would be the time to get involved if, if you're interested um, member hillis uh, Cheryl, in terms of the um, content area experts, um, are there expectations on, on what that consists of? Is that a uh, certificate uh, issued by California, or is it somebody in an IHE that teaches in that discipline, or could it be kind of our discretion on that? The, the law is actually silent. It, does not, it doesn't specify. It just says the teacher preparation program does it. So that's why we're we're encouraging institutions to look at within um, their own expertise and try to figure out you know what their process ought to be. Um, so so one of the things that we'll be probably thinking about in terms of accreditation is asking an institution what is your process? You know how defensible is it? And you know, um, but but the law is actually silent as to who makes the decisions or who's involved in that. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other committee member have a comment or question? Okay, thanks again as always for the detailed report. It's nice to be kept in the loop and I'm sure if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to the staff and they'll be able to answer that for you. Uh, moving on to item six then. Item six, we begin the program approval recommendation. And for program approvals, this section is for action. There are three institutions with three programs for approval. And I believe we do have representatives from the three institutions with us to answer any questions you may have about the programs. And I suggest we take them one at a time and we can vote for each one individually. So let's begin with Humboldt State University for a single subject credential intern. The Humboldt State already has a single subject teaching program. So this proposal is to add the intern pathway. And joining us today to answer any questions about the proposed programs for Humboldt State are Dr. Heather Bollinger, Secondary Education Program Leader and Intern Programming Lead, and Dr. James F. Woglum. Did I get that correctly? Woglum? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Woglum or Woglum? What would you prefer? Um, Woglum is great. All right, Woglum. Thank you. Uh, who is the Elementary Education Program Leader? Are there any recusals on this item? All right, seeing none, would the institutional representatives like to say anything about the program? I think I might have misheard you, but I just wanted to make sure that you you said it was, we're trying to reinstate our multiple subjects intern program. And I think I heard you say single subject. We have it listed as single. Um, Thank Aaron you for that or, correction. Yeah, it's, sure. the, the summary says single subject, and I'm assuming... If it's multiple subject, then that is just a typo. Oh, it's because we, we currently have a approved single subject intern program. Um, and, and that has been the case for, for okay. quite a few, for quite a okay. while. Um, the multiple subjects, reinstating the multiple subjects intern okay. program is what we're here to discuss. And I don't know okay. if um, Miranda Gutierrez, are you on? Do we see Miranda? Oh, go ahead, Aaron. I just promoted Miranda. I was also sending her a side message okay, to just right. make sure. So 
sorry to put you on the spot, Miranda. But she's um, <laughs> one of our she's one of our IPR consultants. So is Poonam. So um, Hi, that's, you should actually um, pull in Bob for this one. Oh, oh sorry, Bob. That's OK. Thank you, Bob. Bob is not with us at the moment. So he might be talking to a site visit institution. OK. Okay. Well, thank so, you, Dr. Bellinger, for the clarification. Yeah, thanks for appreciate. Apologize. It. So we will get that corrected on our end here for the minutes and the notes. Um, but any, what wish to make any comment, Dr. Uh, Ballinger or Dr. Waglin? Yeah, I mean, um, I think we we've um, had some grant funding to pursue um, some local interest in reinstating our intern program. I think it. I mean, it is reflective of our teacher shortage that we have across the state of California, but mostly in mm -hmm. local rural areas, including our indigenous communities um, that we have. Um, Cal State Teach does meet some of that need, um, but as we have these grant monies to pursue um, through my position uh, that's been recently appointed as intern coordinator, um, we've been looking into just in, uh, trying to encourage as many pathways to credentialing in Humboldt County as possible. So that is the intention. We also have a robust and very strong and um, growing intern program in our, in our single subject that is um, across the state of California. Um, it's the only one in the CSU system. So I feel like we're perfectly poised here to um, increase our intern possibilities within are reinstating our multiple subjects intern program. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Walcom, any comment you wish to offer? Um, only that I, I'm excited by the prospect here that I open up um, to a more equitable access to the teaching profession throughout our county that is um, sort of lacking with our existing program. It, it's designed in such a way that um, only folks who are able to take kind of a, a year off from work and a, a year off from um, everything are, are able to attend. And if we can open up this process, we can work with people to um, make teaching a possibility for a much broader swath of people. And well stated, there definitely is a need for it, obviously. Um, any member of the public wish to comment on the item? And saying no comments, Bob. Okay, thank you. So we now move on to the committee um, members. And, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. Can I just sure, sure. shortly? Okay, because the, because there's confusion, I don't want anybody to feel uneasy about this. So what I have done is pull up our tracking sheet um, that we keep for IPR programs. And so I just want to let the committee know that I have fully verified that, in fact, the typo is our error and that Humboldt State is um, is seeking uh, approval to, to uh, reopen their multiple subject intern program. I thank you, Erin, for, for the mm -hmm. clarification. Yeah. Typos happen, but thank you, appreciate it. Um, Member Forbes. Thank you. So um, as an intern program sponsor in the UC system, I'm really excited to hear about more intern programs coming online and eager to learn from each other when possible. So I was just a little curious about um, the uh, what you call the special field work classes and assessments that would be for the interns. Just if you could just say a little bit about what those consist of, since we didn't have the full document to look at. The, the question was about what field work would look like. Well, I think it says special field work classes and evaluation forms have been developed for interns to meet their specific situations. So that was the piece that I was interested in. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things that we've been noticing in our single subject intern program is that our candidates have been um, hired on a PIP or a STIP, and then they're kind of at the end of, of that when they come to us, and they're kind of in freak out mode, and they need to be recommended for an intern credential immediately. So one of the, the things that we're pursuing is how to meet those pre-service hours in a, in a module 
um, that can be done um, maybe perhaps in late July, early August, so that they can um, get their pre-service hours completed and then um, be begin the fall semester with their with their intern credential. Um, so that's one way that we're we're exploring some of that. In in terms of field work, we're revising our MOU to get more um, buy-in and assistance from the participating districts. So um, we're looking into compensating mentors, which we have not been able to do because of our budget. And so making districts make a financial um, uh, commitment to um, supporting the mentor teachers who are supporting the interns at their fieldwork site. In addition to that, we've been doing some additional um, preparation and um, uh, for our supervisors that specifically work with interns and are discussing um, intern specific needs. So those are just three examples of kind of how we're trying to tailor um, our current intern program. And we're, we're trying, we're considering making um, a type of common trunk for our interns um, in both secondary and multiple subjects so that we're kind of focusing on um, the beginning of school and, and setting them up for success. Because what we've realized is where our candidates um, struggle the most is the onset of the HSU semester as well as the start of school. And so we're really trying to focus our support efforts um, related to field work in, in that area. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. And um, I can relate to a lot of what you said. I'm very curious uh, to hear further information as you proceed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other committee member have any uh, comment or question? Yeah, Member Lee. Yeah, I just um, <clears throat> wanted to kind of ask a question around the partnerships you're doing with um, your Indigenous communities to increase the number of um, uh, Indigenous folks entering into the educational field as teachers? Um, that's definitely an area that we could um, do more recruitment in. Currently, what, what we have been doing is more, they have been contacting us about their need and their desire to increase their applicant pool and their intern pool. And so um, we were contacted with the need, although we were aware of the need, um, but that's definitely an area that I think we need to specifically identify and work on in terms of, of current efforts. Um, Jim, do you wanna talk a little bit about that or did you wanna to add to that? Well, no, I just in terms of, um local tribal communities that we work with, um, often just geographical distance between um, our university and the schools at their, um, at their sites are, are considerable. So trying to um, address the entirety of your credential program in a one year um, structure where you're, you know, at, at some, you know, in one fairly common case, traveling as much as two hours a day in both directions to, to get to the campus is, um, is really problematic. So finding um, a model where we can sort of spread that out and make it a little bit more doable for folks within um, those geographical spaces in relationship to Humboldt County, which is huge. I mean, it's Connecticut-ish size, um, is, um, and I think it's gonna be helpful for uh, a lot of folks. I, I did some, and, and I don't know, we, uh, Chair uh, Bob, you can correct me if I'm you know out overstepping here, but, um, Please reach out. I did some grant work with a gentleman in your county who was looking to um, get federal funding to support um, local tribes and, and indigenous folks entering the educational world. So I could connect you to. I just think it's great work, and we need our teachers to be represented of the students we serve as much as possible. So. Yeah, Jason, I think you're talking about Jack Borellis, and we, we have been working with him. Um, we got the educational leadership part of that grant, but he didn't end up getting awarded the, um, the K-12 in, uh, in teacher part of that grant. But we were kind of on call all July, um, anticipating possibly 70 more candidates from local indigenous wow. communities, but that ended up not going through for us. That's unfortunate. 
All right, thank you. Um, and that was totally appropriate to mention, uh, Member Lee. Um, any other comments or questions from committee members? Okay, is there a motion to approve the reinstatement of the multiple subject credential intern program for Humboldt State University? Uh, Member Forbes. I move that we um... I move that the multiple subject intern program at Humboldt State University be reinstated. Thank you. So move. Is there a second? Second by Member Balatayo. Will the secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Amo. Cynthia? Is she on? I don't okay. see her on. Maybe she had tech issues. Okay. Jamaline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krishna? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? <laughs> Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Jason Lee? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. All right, motion carries. Congratulations and good luck with the efforts in a, a much needed area. So I wish you all the success with that. All right, have a great day. Um, we do have a, a 9.30 time certain, but I'd like to proceed through this item first, and then we can move on to item 10. So moving forward within this area, we have the next program proposal is from CSU Monterey Bay uh, for a speech language pathology services program. Joining us to answer any questions you might have about the program are Dr. Carrie Lemons Chetwood, Chetwood, Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology Program Director and Dr. Kathy Draper Rodriguez, Department Chair, Education and Leadership. Are there any recusals on this item? All right, seeing none, would the institutional representatives like to say anything about the proposed program? Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I do wanna thank the commission for their review and communication throughout this process. Um, even ongoing throughout the meeting this morning, I just really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I appreciate this opportunity to hopefully be able to offer a program that uh, will help meet the needs of our local region as well as the state. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Good morning. I would just like to reiterate what, what Carrie shared. It's been, you know, as always, a joy to work with the CTC. They answer every single question we could ever imagine. Miranda, I, I really feel bad. I feel like I harass her at times, but she's amazing. <laughs> so all the staff at uh, CTC is always really gracious with their time to support our program. So I, again, thank you all for the review. And, and this one went so smoothly. And Dr. Chick worked, worked really hard on this program. So again, we're really glad to be here. Really excited about our new program. Great, thank you, welcome. And thank you for the comments about the staff. They live to be harassed, so don't let that scare you away. Um, <laughs> let's uh, take it to the public. Any of the public wish to offer any comment on the item? No public comments, Paul. All right, thank you. Any committee members have any questions for the representatives from CSU Monterey Bay? All right, seeing none, is there a motion to approve CSU Monterey Bay's Speech Language Pathology Services Program? Motion by Member Morrison. I move that we uh, accept uh, the University of Southern California uh, Monterey Bay uh, program. For Speech Language Pathology oh, Services? Yes, okay. for Speech Language Pathology. All right, thanks, Sherry. Is there a second? Second by Member Larson. Any further comment? All right, will the Secretary please call the roll? Cynthia Almo. Aye. Domaline Bolotayo. Aye. Kathy Krishna. Aye. Cheryl Forum. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, it looks like Cynthia Amo. So you, you have a question or was there a voting? Uh, no, I don't have a question. Um, I was just okay, saying just... that where I am is very windy and I'm having technical difficulties. So I've actually had to switch devices. So if I go in and out or freeze, please uh, forgive me. 
Okay, no worries. Thank you. Uh, so the motion carries, and congratulations uh, for your Wonderful. efforts and good luck. And uh, Monterey is like one of the most beautiful areas, if not the most beautiful in California. Um, so whenever I get back up there, I'm going to knock on the door and say hi. Yes, please do. Please um, do. Yeah, thank you all, all right. so much. And I will actually see you again at 1130. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. All right. Thank Bye. you. Congratulations. Bye. 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 We have one more program uh, proposal, and this is from the University of Southern California for a speech language pathology services program. Joining us to answer any questions you might have about the program for the University of Southern California is Barbara Moore, Professor, Program Director, Master of Science in Speech, Language Pathology. Are there any recuses on the side? Yes, I need to recuse one. myself. Thank you, Member Tracy. Any others? All right. Welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Moore. Oh, good to see you. Any questions or any comments you wish to offer for us? Is it time for me to make comments? Yeah, it's time for you to go out. Anything you'd like to speak uh, about the program itself? Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And anybody on the street knows that I'll talk about my program. So it's a particular pleasure to speak with you. I have to note that I spent 36 years in public education as a special ed director. So it is with great joy that I now am at the university and developing this program and specifically interested in ensuring that we can uh, graduate students who are prepared to work in public education. Our program opened in the fall and um, I'm always one step behind my colleagues at um, Cal State Monterey Bay. So really nice to have them right in front of me. Um, just real quickly, our focus is definitely on uh, servicing the urban community. Um, as a, a longtime speech pathologist and involved we, um, at the University of Southern California are very committed to service to the urban community. And I know in training and speech pathology specifically, that it is um, important to be able to train um, clinicians to understand some of the complexities that happen in the urban community. So um, uh, all of our uh, clinical experiences are out in the field, both for education and healthcare. Our students began their very first semester um, providing services or working with uh, master clinicians in the field, clinical educators. So um, we are really excited about this program. And I do have to, like my um, other colleagues, tip my hat to the CTC um, folks. Sorry, I'm still old school, so I say CTC instead of CTC. Um, and my colleague, um, Kathy, uh, for her assistance as well. And I will um, stop that other than to say it's been interesting to uh, listen in on your um, procedures earlier because I know all the acronyms from all my years in school. So, um, so good to be with you this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about our program. Thank you, Professor Bort. Yes, in, in education, we love our acronyms, don't we? Um, any member of the public wish to offer any comment? Okay, no somebody down in, in, All right, thank you. Any committee members have any questions for the representative, for, for Professor Moore from USC? All right, seeing none, this is an action item. So is there a motion to approve USC's Speech Language Pathology Services Program? Member Hillis. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the program for speech language pathology at USC. Second. Thank you. So moved. There's a second by Member Lee. Any further discussion? Well, the secretary, please call the roll. Cynthia Almas. Aye. John Malene Bulatayo. Aye. Charles Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Morrison. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thank you and congratulations, Professor Moore. Whoop, whoop, fight on, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> fight on, Kathy. All right, a familiar face. Good to see you again. All right, you take care. Bye-bye. Bob, -bye. Um, um, can, we, gonna... can we do item seven before you jump to 10? We do have somebody waiting sure. for item seven. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Sure. 
Item 7 is the report of the program status changes, and this item is divided into two parts. Part 1 includes items for action by the COA, which include requests to withdraw, requests to reactivate inactive programs, and or requests to add a new content area to an existing program. Part 2 provides information on programs that have transitioned to revised program standards and programs that have elected to change to inactive status. These items are for notification only and no action is required by the COA. So looking at parts 1, sections A, B, and C. Section A is program withdrawals. Section A is stated as an action. There are four program sponsors withdrawing five programs. Capistrano Unified School District, Education Specialist, Added Authorization, Autism Spectrum Disorder, effective October 28, 2021. Santa Clara University, Education Specialist, Added Authorization, Autism Spectrum Disorder, effective October 28, 2021. Saugus Union School District, Closed Institution, No Active Programs, Teacher Induction, pardon me, Teacher Induction, effective October 28, 2021. Sonoma County Office of Education. Designated subjects, special subjects, effective October 28, 2021. Designated subjects, supervision and coordination, effective October 28, 2021. Any member of the public wish to comment on the items? And we may have a recusal on this one, I'm assuming, Jason. Okay. Yeah, let's take, see no public comment. Uh, this is an action item, so recusals. Do we have one member Lee? Okay, one recusal from member Lee. Any others? All right, is there a motion from a committee member? Member Larson. I move that we accept the recommendation for the withdrawal of professional preparation programs for Capistrano Unified School District, Santa Clara University, Saugus Union School District, and Sonoma County Office of Education. Thank you, Lynn. Well stated. Uh, is there a second? Second by Member Forbes. Any further comments? All right, will the Secretary please do the roll call vote? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Joan Lee Bolotayo. Aye. Kathy Grisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Morrison? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Bird Morrison? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. I will now move on to Section B, Programs Requesting Reactivation. There are no programs requesting reactivation at this time. Section C, Adding a New Content Area. There is one institution requesting to add a new language to an existing bilingual authorization program. The following institution has requested to add a new language in their approved bilingual authorization program. Staff has reviewed the requested documentation to ensure that the program modifications address all of the required competencies. Institution is University of California, Los Angeles. Bilingual authorization in French, October 28, 2021. And we do have representatives from UCLA to answer any questions you might have about the proposed program. I'm here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emma Ipolito. I'm the director of the teacher education program. And we have, an, we have existing um, bilingual pathways in Spanish and Mandarin, and we're asking to add French. And I will add that this is a response to requests from the field and to district partners. And we've worked um, closely with our existing staff um, in the Spanish and Mandarin pathway, as well as um, the UCLA Department of European Language and Trans, I think it's Transcultural Studies, I'm probably messing up their name, um, to, to develop uh, modules that are language and cultural specific for French. Um, and uh, we will bring in, we currently have folks with expertise in bilingual education and Spanish and Mandarin language and culture. And we will be adding uh, folks with um, this uh, a specialization in, in French language and culture as well. Um, currently our Mandarin student, our candidates in the Mandarin pathway take um, uh, CSET three, and we would ask the same for our um, candidates in the French language pathway. And um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, to present this work. Well, absolutely. Thank you, Professor Abelito. Uh, any member of the public wish to offer a comment? 
No public comment involved. All right. Okay, this is uh, action item. Are there any recusals? All right, is there a motion from a committee member? Motion by Member Forbes. Thank you. Good morning. I move that we um, accept the recommendation for adding a new language to an existing bilingual program for UC University of California, Los Angeles in French. All right. Thank you, uh, Member Forbes. Is there a second? Second by Member Balatayo. Any further discussion or questions? I have a secretary. Please call the roll call vote. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Domaline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Freeland. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Morrison. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason May. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Ms. Hippolito. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We appreciate it. That's great. Thank you. You bet. Have a good day. We're going to move on to part two, sections D and E. And the next two sections are for notification purposes only and no action is required. Section D, programs transitioning. There are no programs requesting transition at this time. Section E, programs moving to inactive status. This section is for notification only and no action is required. There are two program sponsors moving two programs to inactive status. First is California State University of Long Beach, and their designated subject, Career Technical Education, effective October 29th, 2021. The second is Green Dot Public School, Preliminary Administrative Services, effective October 29th, 2021. So that concludes item seven. And Cheryl, are we ready to move on to item 10? And then we'll circle back to do item nine. Well, we have we or have individuals here for item eight as well. So I think if we go eight and skip right. nine and then go 10, that'd be great. Okay, so 10 can wait at this time? Uh, yeah, because we have also people waiting for eight. From okay, the got it, thank world. you. So, okay, thank you. Item eight is the initial program approval for new program sponsors. We have two programs requesting to add two new Sorry, two sponsors requesting to add two new programs. And the first program proposal is from San Mateo Union High School District for a teacher induction program. Consultant Punam Beidi will introduce this item. And joining her today to answer any questions you may have are institutional representatives Kirk Black, Deputy Superintendent of HR, and uh, Sabi, pardon me, um, I'm sorry, and Sabi Hopkins, Professional Development and Instructional Coaching coordinator. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Betty, will you please begin? Yes, thank you. Good morning, committee members. As uh, co-chair Farley just mentioned, this is the first of two stage four I items that are being presented this morning. So let's begin. The first half of this item presents the San Mateo Union High School District's responses to the teacher induction program standards for the Committee on Accreditation's consideration and possible approval. As indicated in the item, the San Mateo Union High School District was granted provisional approval by the commission at its June 2021 meeting. Provisional approval, when granted at the conclusion of stage three of the IA process, only authorizes an institution to offer the proposed program. Then it is on the COA to make the determination on approving or denying the program for operation in stage four of the IIA process. And this is indicated on page three of the item in the five stages of the IIA chart. A team of two qualified reviewers collaborated on a review of San Mateo's stage four submission, and they came to a consensus on a final finding of a line for each of the teacher induction program standards. And on page two of the item, you will find the hyperlink to the final submission and reviewer feedback that is housed on San Mateo's um, IA webpage. And in conclusion, as um, was just introduced earlier, we have Kirk Black, Deputy Superintendent of Human Resources, and Savvy Hopkins, Professional Development and Instructional Coaching Coordinator with us today. And they are available to answer any programmatic questions COA members may have. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Biddy. Um, any co comments you wish to offer from the institutional representatives? Oh, thank you for considering our submission. 
Um, it's been a it's been almost five years, uh, and we learned a great deal. I would like to thank Poonam and, and all the staff at the CCTC. They've been very responsive responsive at every step, and extremely helpful. Also, uh, thanks to the volunteer reviewers that um, donated their time and gave us insightful feedback. And if I may uh, hand this over to Savvy, but uh, before doing that, I just want to acknowledge her leadership in this area. She guided us through these years and kept us on track and has been an inspiration to me and, and everyone here. And I think she would probably like to say, uh, provide a comment as well. I just want to say how excited we are to have the opportunity to provide induction services to the teacher within our district. And um, we, you know, we're happy to answer, answer any questions that you have right now. Okay, thank you both. Uh, this, uh, any member of the public wish to offer any comment or have any questions? A public comment. Oh. Okay. Um, any additional comments or questions from the COA members? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve San Mateo Union High School District for a teacher induction program? Member Martinez. I move that we approve San Mateo Union High School for a teacher, indust, uh, teacher induction program. Okay, thank you. Union High School District, right? Thank you. High School and District. Is there a second? Okay. I yeah, second. Sure. And is there a se second I by, looks like, I hear a second. Almost. I see a second. Almost. Oh, I, yeah. thank like you. I'm Remember, almost. Thank you. For you. <laughs> <laughs> we see you. Um, Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, will the secretary please call the roll call vote? Cynthia Almos? Aye. John Malene Blitzhayo? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Aye. Mike Hillis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Jason Lee? Jason? Sorry, I'm getting choppy. Aye. And Gerard Morrison. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Black, Ms. Hopkins, and Ms. Beatty. Thank you all for joining us. Okay, we're going to move on to the second program proposal. And this is from Livermore Valley Joint Uni Unified School District for a Teacher Induction Program. Consultant Dr. Michelle Williams-George will introduce the item. And joining her today to answer any questions you might have are institutional representatives Leslie Williams, Consortium Director and Livermore Valley Induction Coordinator, Catherine Nissen, Dublin Unified School District Induction Coordinator, and Megan Sutcliffe, Castro Valley Unified School District Induction Director. Anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Williams-George, will you please begin? Thank you and good morning committee members. It is my pleasure to be here to present the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District's responses to stage four of the initial institutional approval process for the committee's consideration and for possible approval of their proposed teacher induction program. However, before addressing the agenda information, I would like to review the context of this institution. Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District has been a collaborative partner in a teacher induction program since 2003. This was the Tri-Valley Teacher Induction Project, which was a consortium which included Pleasanton Unified, Dublin Unified, and Livermore Valley Joint Unified. Castro Valley Unified joined the consortium in 2007. Pleasanton Unified School District was the program sponsor for this consortium. This group of districts successfully functioned as a collaborative teacher induction consortium for 16 years until the 2019-2020 academic year when Pleasanton Unified left the consortium. San Ramon Unified School District stepped in as the program sponsor as Livermore Valley Joint Unified completes the IIA process to become the identified program sponsor of the Tri-Valley Teacher Induction Project, which now consists of Livermore Valley Joint, Dublin and Castro Valley Unified School Districts. The second iteration of the Tri-Valley Teacher Induction Project has demonstrated a strong focus on collaboration 
with full input of each consortium partner, as represented by the three district coordinators with us today. While Livermore Valley Joint Unified, if approved, will be the program sponsor and ultimately responsible for both the overall program and its credential recommendations. The teacher injection program itself will be an amalgamation of addressing the individual district needs of the consortium partners, as well as CTC requirements. Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District was granted provisional institutional approval by the commission at its August 2021 meeting. As stated earlier, the institution is now in stage four of the IIA process, which you will see highlighted on the chart at the end of this agenda item. As you know, stage four requires institutions to respond to program specific standards. Those responses are then collaboratively reviewed by two qualified BIR reviewers who provide recursive feedback until they come to consensus on a finding of a line for all program standards. As an aside, Staff noticed an error of fact on this agenda item after it's posting. So if you printed the document prior to this week, um, we wanna make you aware of the correction. And that would be on page two in the last paragraph of the institution summary. The second to the last sentence should read, growth on both individual goals and the California standards for the teaching profession, CSTPs, will be measured through two candidate coach co-assessments on the continuum of teaching practice for each cycle of inquiry, beginning and year-end ILP reviews. Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District's responses to both the teacher induction program standards and the BIR review are for the committee's consideration and for possible provisional approval. You will find hyperlinks to these submissions, as well as all previous IIA submissions on page two of this agenda item. Finally, based on a finding of MET for all program standards, staff recommends initial program approval. This will allow Livermore Valley and its consortium partners to offer a teacher induction program, collect and submit relevant data, and then host a provisional site visit in three years. After that, excuse me, after that provisional site visit, commission staff will bring a complete report before the COA for consideration of full approval. As I previously stated, three representatives, one from each district involved in the consortium, are here to answer programmatic and institutional questions. It is my pleasure to reintroduce Leslie Williams, Consortium Director and Livermore Valley Induction Coordinator, Catherine Nissen, Dublin Unified Induction Coordinator, and Megan Sub Sutcliffe, Castro Valley Union Induction Director. Staff is happy to answer any process questions and Ms. Williams, Ms. Nissen, and Ms. Sutcliffe are here to answer any questions regarding their stage four submission and their proposed teacher induction program. Thank you for your attention to this item. Uh, thank you for the thoroughness, Ms. Williams, George, appreciate it. So we invite the institutional representatives to offer any comment or question you wish to make. Good morning, I'm Leslie Williams from the Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District. And I'm really excited to bring you this, our induction program. Um, Catherine and Megan and I have been working hand in hand over the last year to uh, write our consortiums program. And we really wanna thank um, Michelle William, Williams George for all of her guidance over this last year. She has been really instrumental in moving our program forward. Um, so I really appreciate her input every step, step of the way. Megan and Casey, would you like to say anything before we begin? I'd just like to reiterate what Leslie said. We were very excited to be here and thank all of you for the support. Michelle has been incredible every step of the way. So really would like to ditto Leslie's statements, acknowledging her. And this came up earlier when you started the office hours that, um, have been happening all year have been really helpful when we have questions it's an opportunity for us to hear from other programs and um, share resources and ideas so just want to thank everybody for that opportunity as well um, our regional programs induction programs in our area have also been very supportive so thank you again for the opportunity to be here um, and we look forward to hearing any questions that you may have megan do you have anything great thank 
All right, thank you all. And uh, any member of the public wish to offer any comment or question? No public comment. All right, thank you. Um, any discussion, questions, comments at all from the members of the COA? Okay. okay, seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve Livermore Valley Joint Unified School District for a teacher induction program? I move to approve uh, Livermore Joint uh, Livermore Joint Unified a teacher induction program. Right. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Uh, I saw hey, I'm sorry. I saw Member Balatayo, but I heard a voice. But we'll go with second with Member Balatayo, and you were all awesome for doing seconds. Um, so at this point, will the secretary please call the roll call vote? Cynthia Almos. Aye. Jamalin Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. So thank you and congratulations, Ms. Williams, Ms. Nissen, and Ms. Sutcliffe. And also thank you for your work, Ms. Williams George. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, have a great day. We're going to skip over item nine and come back to that later. We'll circle back around, but we'll move on to item 10. Um, item 10, we appreciate the patience for those of you who have been waiting to join us. Uh, this is the report of the provisional site visit accreditation team to Burton School District. Consultant Gay Roby will introduce the item and joining her today to answer any questions you may have are institutional representatives, Treasurer Weisenberger, Human Resources Director, Alexandra Aiello, Human Resources Coordinator, and Debbie Estrada, HR Executive Director. Does anyone need to recuse himself? All right, seeing none, Ms. Robo, you please begin. Thank you very much. Very appropriate that item 10 follows the one you just finished because we moved from stage four of IIA into stage five. So they have Burton School District, which is a small school district uh, located at the north end of our Central Valley in Porterville. California uh, received their uh, stage four approval in 2018 and started their teacher induction program that year. So they are just in the middle of their fourth year of implementation, just starting. They were a long time participant in the Tulare County Office of Education's induction program and then broke off to do a standalone pro, uh, program, which um, their candidates received very nicely, by the way. A reminder for you that the pro, uh, provisional site visit is a little bit different than the traditional site visit. Um, as Poonam said back in June, it's a truncated version of the years four through six in that they do program reviews, uh, common standards review. They have received feedback, they give a response to that feedback. And for this instance, the entire site visit team looks at those uh, documents and the evidence pieces, as well as looking at their data, uh, data at our accreditation data system and looking at candidate work. So instead of having smaller teams, the entire team looks at that. So they have a more robust body of work in which to make their recommendations. And then again, another uh, tweak is that instead of um, making a final decision, the COA, will be thinking, what would be your recommendation if this was a traditional site visit in a seven year accreditation cycle? And instead it goes to the full commission. We're taking that to them in December and they will take action to give them full status approval. And if that occurs, then they would be assigned a color cohort. They would start uh, the regular processes and steps that are in any seven year accreditation cycle. So that being said, it's my very strong pleasure to bring you this report. The Burton School District's provisional site visit happened just a couple of weeks ago, October 11th through the 13th. And so we hurried to bring this to the COA so they wouldn't have to wait on pins and needles for a couple of months. They are a very small school district. They have nine schools, but half of their schools are, charter, are through a charter system and half are public schools as well. Um, they had 
68 people show up for a very small program. So as Cheryl mentioned earlier, we're having some problems with uh, attending, not so in Burton. They really did have a strong uh, representation from their stakeholder groups. We sent a three-person site visit team with myself um, added to that team. And as I said, they interviewed 68 stakeholders over a course of two days. And it was an online visit, but all normal protocols were followed. Normally at this time, I would turn this over to our team lead. However, she has had a personal um, need come up and she's had to bow out. So she handed me her thoughts that she had written down. So I would like to read her report from the site visit. The Burton School District is in its fourth year of implementing the teacher induction program they call TIP. The program is well integrated into the district's infrastructure, so much so they operate like a tightly knit family with a common aspiration that all adults and students in the organization be on a continuous learning trajectory. One example of this is that when how a when asked how a teacher induction program fits into the larger vision and goals of the district, the superintendent replied, it is a perfect fit. We want all of our learners to excel, the student learner and the adult learner. Communication and collaboration are a priority throughout the entire district. And this includes the teacher induction program as well. Program leadership, mentors and site and professional development personnel are all well qualified in their positions and they implement a robust program of professional development that is rooted in research-based practice. The program director and the coordinator create the face and main supports of the program structures. They are both accessible and involved going to school site visits, which are called roundings, I believe, if I remember correctly, and candidates, as well as answering emails in a very top, prompt time frame, regardless of the time of day, in fact, we had a couple of candidates say they uh, would receive an email from Alexandra midnight or so. She'd be up answering those questions because she knew that was when they had time in their day. Together, the mentors and the district's professional development team provide both just-in-time and long-range professional development that is strictly identified by the candidates themselves. The program's advisory committee, which is more like what we think of as a leadership team, provides input, feedback, and advice on the operations of the program. All district personnel who support the teacher induction program participate in thoughtful and well-designed processes that provide for the success of their candidates through advertising, excuse me, advising, mentoring, and a supportive assessment experience. The unit has a thoughtful assessment system that ensures continuous improvement and provides for systematic reflection by the candidate that is based on data. Interviews and direct evidence provided during the site visit affirm the success of the induction candidates in both completion of the IIP and in the performance of their job responsibilities. A strong focus on and a commitment to supporting new teachers in making positive impact as educators was clearly communicated throughout the program stakeholder interviews, which has fostered a strong impact on student learning, candidate classroom practice, and the wider educational community. They implement a robust program of professional development for both new teachers and their mentors. And this system is part of a successful peer mentoring priority shared by all school sites across the district, ensuring that the TIP program is well-resourced and a true part of the <laughs> overall priorities of the Burton School District. In conclusion, the team visit found that all program standards were met, all common standards were met, and their recommendation would be a full status accreditation. All right, thank you for a very thorough report, Ms. Rowe, we appreciate it. Uh, we now invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you it's not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather provide any thoughts that you may have regarding the visit. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. We would like to thank the site visit accreditation team for just a wonderful experience. The process was very organized and they made our staff feel comfortable during the interviews. Um, as Gay mentioned, we did have great attendance for our interviews and that was a success. 
Um, a big thank you to Gay Roby, our CCTC consultant. Um, she was with us every step of the way and answered all of our questions. We appreciate her so much. Also, we wanted to thank um, the team lead, Connie Campbell, who isn't with us this morning, for her leadership in the accreditation process. The entire team was friendly and very supportive. We appreciate the feedback that we received from the team in order to continue to grow and expand our program. Um, our district is just so appreciative of the opportunity to offer this teacher induction program to our new teachers. Thank you, Ms. Weisenberger. Anybody else wish for any comment? Dr. Ayala, Ms. Estrada? Sorry, opportunity for the public to offer any comments or questions. No public comments, Bob. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions at all from the committee members or comments that you wish to make? Member Balataya. Hello. Um, I I was reading this report and I, I noticed the, the great response that the district has for um, for um, candidate feedback, and, and that's that's really that's really great to hear. To, um, and um, those very supportive of candidates. Um, my question is um, regarding um, Common Standard Two and Common Standard Four. Um, so moving forward, um, what systems have you put in place to hire more diverse faculty members, and um, how will you incorporate program ads to drive um, from ADS? to drive continuous improvement. Okay. Um, so we have recently connected with two local colleges to support us in this area um, of recruitment of diverse faculty. And so we've invited um, two members from both of those IHEs to be on our advisory um, committee. We're kind of revamping our advisory committee, um, as Gay mentioned, the leadership portion, and then trying to invite other members to be part of our advisory committee. And of course, taking this topic then to our advisory um, committee to help us with other ideas, maybe outreach you know, that we haven't thought of. And then in addition, um, we are providing as a district equity training to all of our candidates and mentors, as well as program leaders. Um, and in that case, it's more of um, helping our new teachers work with all of their students, the diverse populations of students and colleagues. Um, so we feel like that's a piece too. Um, so we're excited with our new connections with our local universities and hoping they can help us with outreach in that area. Thank you, Ms. Weisenberger. Uh, any other committee member have a comment or question? Member Forbes. You're muted, Cheryl. Sorry, Cheryl. <laughs> you think I'd get this right after a year and a half? <laughs> um, anyway, thank you for that response because that was uh, something I was curious about as well. You know, moving forward, the diversity recruitment and then also the um, plan to use the ADS data as you um, uh, are guided in program improvement by that data. Uh, do you have any comments on that particular aspect? That was common standard four, I think. Yes, so we'll be looking at our ADS data, um, just kind of, you know, getting into that system as a new program and helping, you know, again, using our advisory board, we, um, one of the recommendations from the team was to present that data to yeah. our um, advisory committee or board and then have them help analyze that and then bring that to the team for new ideas. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to commend you as well uh, as a district and a community for taking on this, um, you know, uh, mounting an induction program, which is no small feat in, institutionally, you know, as we've seen um, through the COA. Um, and it was really reflected well in your report and the comments of some of the participants on why they appreciated that local connection and the, and the integration with the vision of the district. So, um, you know, kudos to everyone on that. And thank you to the team for uh, including such great examples in your report. It's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Member Forbes. Any other committee member have any comment or question? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item. So is there a motion from a committee member? Member Forbes. 
So I, I move that we um, accept the recommendation of accreditation as, uh, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused what we're advising, the com are we advising the commission that we recommend accreditation? Okay, so I recommend that we advise the commission to, uh, to recommend accreditation for the um, Burton, okay, so great stuff going back up, Burton School District um, induction program. All right, thank you, Ms. Forbes. Is there a second? Second. Second, uh, second by Member Balotayo. Any further discussion? Secretary, please call the roll call vote. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Shomalane Balotayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Morrison. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. It's motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Weisenberger, Dr. Aiello, Ms. Estrada, and also, as always, Gay Roby. Thank you, Ms. Roby. And congratulations. Thank you. All right, thank you for your patience also. We have a 1015 time certain item 11, and I know item 9 we can always come back to at another time. Uh, do we have all the representatives from Las Virginas Unified as well as the we, consultants? We do. Give me just a moment. I wasn't sure if you were going to call for a break, so let me just, they, but they're here. So, yeah, I think if we can do them and then we'll do a break and move on to item 12 after okay. the break. Actually, oh, I'm looking at the wrong list. Sorry, everyone. No worries. Okay, here we go. Bringing folks in. Sure. All right. That's everyone. Okay, we're good to go. Mm hmm. Okay, thank you. Item 11 is the discussion of the first quarterly report for Las Virginas Unified School District. Consultants William Hattrick and Dr. Michelle Williams-George will introduce the item. And joining them today to answer any questions you might have is Institutional Representative Ryan Gleason, Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services. Does anyone need to recuse himself? We have one recusal, Member Hillis. Second recusal, Member Lee. And this is just a... a is that point of um, just a question, Bill, is since I was part of this sure. visitation team back in May, this was prior to my mm -hmm. acceptance, I should probably recluse myself from this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then we do have the two recusals, Member Hillis and Member Lee, and that still leaves us with a quorum, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. All right, uh, Mr. Hatrick, will you please begin? All right, good morning, committee members. Agenda item 11 outlines the first quarterly report for the Las Virginas Unified School District since their provisional site visit uh, report was presented to you at the June 2021 meeting. At that time, the team recommendation was for LVUSD uh, to uh, recommended accreditation with stipulations and to provide updates to a quarterly intervals. The report contains a summary of the actions taken, ongoing plans to address the stipulations and additional evidence links, and I'll highlight some of those now. Uh, related to the first stipulation, LBUSD has developed additional ways to work with its partners to select school sites and site-based supervisors, including new job descriptions and a formal interview process. For the teacher induction program, the candidate's individual learning plan was revised to better align with the language of the program standards, including a self-assessment component, a professional goal, growth goal that is specific and measurable, two teaching and learning cycles, and conducting instructional rounds to see examples of high-quality teaching. Mentors will work with candidates on identifying a problem area of practice, participate in a coaching development plan, weekly meetings with district administration and attending quarterly teacher induction regional collaborative meetings. For the preliminary administrative services credential, program design is being modified to better align with principles of adult learning theory and the program is currently strengthening its partnerships with all affiliated school districts and looking to expand IHE partnerships this year. LVUSD program staff recently attended the CCTE conference in San Diego as suggested by CTC staff. The next quarterly report update will be due at the beginning of January and will be presented to you at your February 2022 meeting. 
Uh, Assistant Superintendent Ryan Gleason is also on today, should you have any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Hedrick. Uh, Dr. Williams George, welcome back. Uh, any comments you wish to offer? Uh, no, William uh, spoke for both of us. All right, thank you. All right, uh, we now invite the institutional representative to make any comment about the report. Uh, so, so good morning, Mason, everyone. Have, yeah. yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think William gave the uh, the executive summary, uh, covered it well. We uh, hit the ground running. There's a lot of great revisions that have come out of this process, uh, as well as great connections. So um, in terms of building our network of partners and our network of collaborators, you know, that was an underlying theme in our report. And so we... Um, all, you know, just in the past few weeks have had great leads that came out of the conference that was recommended by CTC as an example. So uh, off, off, off the races have uh, made a lot of great changes and they're already bearing fruit and looking forward to continuing in the next uh, few quarters. Great. Right. Thanks, Mr. Gleason. Any member of the public wish to offer any comment on the item? No public comment. Thank you, Michelle. Are there any questions or comments from committee members? Member Morrison. I'd just like to say I appreciated reading this report on how all of the stipulations are being addressed. And I especially like the way I could just read the way you're addressing the stipulations and then see the links right to the evidence right there. Uh, just want to commend you on that. I made it a lot, a lot easier for me to, to appreciate um, the work that you've been doing. Thank you, Member Morrison. Any other committee member? Okay, this is noted as an information uh, or action item. However, action is not required. We can either vote to accept the report uh, or we can have a motion to accept formally the first quarterly report for Las Virginas Unified School District. So it seem appropriate to at least have a motion to accept the report. So, uh, Member Forbes. I move we accept the first quarterly report of the Las Virginas um, School Unified School District. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Balatayo. Any further discussion? Will Secretary please call the roll call vote? Cynthia Almos? Aye. Jolene Balatayo? Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Frilly? Aye. Lynn Morrison? Aye. Bernie Martinez? Aye. George Morrison? Aye. Right, mo motion carries unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Gleason. And thank, thank you, you uh, Mr. Hatrick. And absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Hatrick. Thank you, Dr. Williams George, as always. And that brings us to a conclusion of item number 11. And what I'm going to propose we do is we do a break. We have a 1030 time certain, which is item 12, and we can always come back to item nine later in the day. Um, so if we take a 10 minute break, that will be a, bring us right up to 1030. So at that point, I will go ahead and turn the meeting over to our colleague and co-chair, Marty Martinez. Uh, any other questions at all before we leave? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll see you all at 1030. Hey, it is. Uh... 1030 and let's go ahead and move on to item number 12. Item 12 is a discussion of possible changes to the 2021-2022 COA meetings uh, dates and uh, analyst Michelle Bernardo will introduce this item. Go ahead, Mrs. Bernardo. Oh. Okay, so at the request of um, one of the um, co-chairs, we're bringing back this, uh, the COA 2021-22 COA dates um, for reconsideration, specifically for the March 24th, 25th, um, to 2022 date. Um, we've noted that March 7th and 8th is not available due to a conflict um, with the California Council on Teacher Education Conference and March 31st is a state holiday. 
So um, two of the possible options that we've um, come up with are March 17th and 18th, which is a Thursday and Friday. And then March 29th and 30th is a Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, so those are the two possible alternative dates, although um, you're welcome to um, you know, present other dates that might work for you. Um, we usually have our meetings on two, uh, Thursday and Friday, but you know, uh, we can open it up during the week, preferably not a Monday. <laughs> Monday's um, really busy or you know, coming back from the weekend. So um, any questions or comments? And Michelle, I had one and yeah, sure. And it was actually, I had brought this and uh, I apologize. I'm actually going to be presenting at a conference that week, the end of that week on the 23rd, 24th, actually through the 26th. I don't know the exact presentation date yet. I suspect it's going to be on the 24th. That's what I've been told in advance. So I was just requesting to uh, see if there's an option to move it um, so that it wouldn't end up miss missing the meeting. I understand everybody has, has busy schedules as well. So that was just a request that I had made if we could revisit that and see if there were some other options. Member Larson. Um, just selfishly, I would advocate for the 17th to 18th. The, um, the other week is the week before our SoCal Odyssey of the Mind State Tournament. And it is just a crazy week for me um, getting ready for that large, complicated in-person, hopefully, event with many COVID protocols in place. So. Um, but I can just, I haven't missed the meeting yet, I don't think so. I would just, I would probably step out of that one if it was that week. If we do move to the 17th and 18th, I would strongly advocate we all wear green. <laughs> Any other comments? And so how about, um, is there a motion by a committee member to accept the new proposed 2022 COA meeting dates? Um, we've, we've heard, I think right now, um, what we've heard is preference for the 17th and 18th. At least that's been expressed. Does anybody have any concerns about those dates? Okay, do we have a motion by a committee member? Member Larson. I move that we hold our March Committee on Accreditation meetings on March 17th and 18th. Okay, do I have a second? Member Hillis, a seconded. And we'll now do a roll call vote. All those in favor say aye, opposed say no. A secretary, please call the names. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Jomeline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha? Aye. Cheryl Forbes? Aye. Bob Fraley? Bob? What? I'm muted. I'm so sorry. Aye. Uh, Mike Kellis? Aye. Lynn Larson? Aye. Marty Martinez? Aye. Jason Lee? Jason? Looks like he may not have returned yet. Okay. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Okay, motion carries. And so we will be adjusting that March date to March 17th and 18th. And then um, I'm assuming next steps will be to, to uh, revise and then send out the new meeting dates. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bernardo. Um, next, and, uh, if I could we just have, say, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, just a quick thank you, and I appreciate everybody's consideration and flexibility. Thank you. Yes, thanks, everybody. Um, I know we have a time certain at 1045 for item 13. Is now a good time to go back to item 9? Great. Yes, I think that works. Okay. Just a second, let me find my spot here. Okay, item nine is discussions of institutions not in compliance with accreditation timelines. Analyst Michelle Bernardo will present this item. 
Ms. Bernardo, will you begin? Yes. So I just have a quick update. Um, the Pasadena Unified School District was late in submitting their preconditions. Um, that was due on March 31st of 2021. Um, and um, since the posting of this item, they have now submitted their preconditions. So um, they are good. Thank you, Ms. Bernardo. Uh, this is an information action item. No specific action is required by the COA at this time. And I just wanna say that um, having this item go before you each time has been very helpful because we're able to tell the institution, we have to report this to the COA and that has been useful in getting institutions to submit when there have been issues. So thank you for this. It is helpful. I know um, for those of us that have institutions, we don't want to ever be on that list. So it's a motivation. I just wanted, I just wanted to thank Aaron for reaching out to um, Pasadena for getting them um, for submitting. To submit no them. problem. You know, they were they were really responsive um, once I reached out. So. Well, thank you, team. And so, um, Aaron, do we happen to have the uh, folks for item number? Um, 13 with we us? do mm -hmm. okay well then let's go ahead and move forward then with item number okay. 13 so item 13 is a discussion of the six month out report for the pacific union college consultant william patrick will introduce this item joining him today to answer any question you may have is institutional representative dr gene buller department of education chair does anyone need to recuse themselves Okay, thank you. Mr. Hattrick, will you begin, please? All right, good morning again, everyone. Agenda item 13 outlines the six month update from Pacific Union College since their accreditation site visit report was presented to you at the May 2021 meeting. At that time, the team recommendation for PUC was accreditation with stipulations and to provide an update halfway through year seven of their accreditation cycle. The report contains a summary of actions taken, ongoing plans to address the stipulations and additional evidence links. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief summary of those now. So in response to the first stipulation, the education department is expanding its field advisory council to include district superintendents, principals, educators, and community members. In addition, a new LEA advisory council will meet twice per year to advise the program on coursework and fieldwork modifications. Uh, as a reminder, this institution has one program, the multiple and single subject credential program. The department also recruited and hired a full-time faculty member who represents and supports the diversity initiatives at PUC. This includes piloting a program for faculty with learning modules and collaborative conversations with the psychology and social work department on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Related to the criteria and selection of site-based supervisors and school sites, the program worked with the placement coordinator at the largest local LEA, Napa County Office of Ed, to improve the site placement and prospective mentor screening process. Additionally, the program is holding individual meetings for orientation with mentor teachers prior to the beginning of the candidate's fieldwork experience. For continuous improvement at the unit and program level, program staff are holding monthly meetings to discuss and analyze aggregated data and make recommendations and modifications as needed. The next update will be due in the spring and will be presented to the COA at the May 2022 meeting. And we have Program Director Gene Buller here today um, who's joined us should you have any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Hattrick. Uh we now invite uh, the institutional representatives to briefly comment on the report. Um, uh, Ms. Bueller. Uh, we are happy to have an opportunity to improve our program and we're happy with the progress that we've made. Um, and we continue to work on the few remaining items. So we're very pleased for the chance to improve. Thank you. Um, are there any um, member of the public who wish to comment on this item? 
No public comment. Thank you. Any questions or comments from committee members? Okay, this is an information action item. However, action is not required. The COA could vote to accept the report. Um, if, take, if we decide to take action, then we would need a motion to accept the six month out report for Pacific Union College. Do I have a motion? Member Morrison? I move that we accept the six month uh, report for the Pacific Union College. Okay. Do I have a second? That was not our second, I am assuming. I'm going to say it's <laughs> Ida was second. <laughs> Sorry, Member, Bal <laughs> Member Balatayo, thank you for seconding. Uh, we'll now call a roll, a roll call vote. All those in favor say aye, opposed say no. Secretary, please call the names. Cynthia Almos. Aye. Jomeline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Bradley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Jason, you're muted. Aye, sorry. And Gerard Morrison. Aye. Thank you, motion carries. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Bueller and uh, also Mr. Hattrick for your, for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is or, or do we have institutional representatives for item number 14? We do. Yes, we do. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for being here early. So item, <laughs> four, item 14 is the report of actions taken by California State University Dominguez Hills to address stipulations. Administrator Erin Sol Sullivan will introduce this item. She is joined by institutional representatives, Dr. Lisa Hutton, Inter Interim Associate Dean, Dr. Kate Esposito, Chair of Special Education, and Dr. Patricia Marasic, Coordinator of Teacher Induction. And Patricia, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. Okay, does anybody need to recuse, themse recuse themselves from this item? All right, Ms. Sullivan, will you begin? Yes, thank you so much, committee members. So um, the uh, California State University of Dominguez Hills had its site visit in October of 2020. Um, the site visit occurred about mid-month and due to its um, proximity to your October meeting last year, we were unable to bring the report of the team forward until your January meeting. Um, at the time uh, that we brought that forward in January, the committee did vote to approve the team's recommendation of accreditation with stipulations. Um, the stipulation for the institution was focused on um, mentor support, uh, to, to summarize, mentor support in their teacher induction program. Um, because the uh, institution had a few months between its uh, site visit findings and your uh, committee meeting in January, they did arrive at your committee meeting in January um, prepared and dis, uh, prepared with and, dis, and discussed for you a plan that they had already devised for addressing the stipulation. So they had gotten a jump start on that. Um, the uh, requirement on this stipulation was that they submit a one year report demonstrating um, that they had addressed the stipulation. That report was uh, received, the draft of it was received from the institution uh, this last August. Uh, I provided a little bit of feedback. Uh, they addressed that, and we had a finalized report by September. Um, the report is linked for you in the item, um, but just, again, to summarize, um, the site visit team found some issues around the, basically the connection of the institution with the mentors in its teacher induction program. Um, the mentors, many of whom are graduates of CSU Dominguez Hills, are familiar with the faculty in the institution and were happy in their roles, but there were some disconnects for them in terms of them being able to easily access mentoring materials, um, have some mentor training supports, and in some cases, candidates were kind of acting as a liaison between their mentors and their institution. Um, since then, the institution has, um, as you will see in the report, um, they have initiated twice monthly mentor meetings 
Um, they're held twice monthly so that mentors can pick from uh, whichever one they want to attend so that if um, uh, people can accommodate their own schedules as needed. Um, they have created um, a nice Google Drive site that mentors can easily access that, that gives them access to training and support materials there and allows them to um, create uh, feedback documents that they can share with the institution about the candidates that they are mentoring. Um, I think there's one last piece, I'm sorry. No, I think that's it. I apologize. If I left something out, the institution will fill me in, but they did submit that. I had an opportunity to really dig in. They provided a lot of pieces of evidence. Again, if you opened their report, you can kind of link into all of those pieces of evidence. And um, it did appear that they had done um, uh, an excellent job of addressing the stipulation in the report. So at this time, staff is recommending that the COA uh, consider lifting the stipulation from CSU Dominguez Hills and um, grant them a, a status of uh, full accreditation. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Um, we now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment on the report. Thank you. I'm Lisa Hutton, the interim associate dean, and um, we actually really appreciated the feedback and the, the time to strengthen our teacher induction program. It was a relatively new program um, where we went from having just an induction program for special ed, and now it is for both general ed and special ed. Um, and we have a kind of a two-tiered model. Um, one of the tricky parts of having an induction program uh, at the university is that the mentors are not actually employees of ours. And so, um, you know, it, it took some additional work to figure out a system that would work for our mentors. So they have a, both a, a course mentor, they come to courses and they have a site mentor at their school. Um, the majority are special education teachers or folks from charter schools. Um, and we did implement uh, quite a number of things, including the monthly meetings, uh, check-ins, um, the Google Drive. And one thing we just cemented was a way to uh, have incentivized the mentors um, through some stipends. We were kind of caught in the new law with independent contractors. <laughs> and it took a long time for our institution to kind of figure out how we could pay non-employees. And so we figured that out and we feel like that will at least help us incentivize a little bit for our mentors. So um, I think we have a strong program and it's a small program, but it's um, especially helpful to our folks in special ed and teacher ed who are doing their master's degree at the same time. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Um, how about our other, uh, Ms. Esposito or Mrs. Marisich? Is okay. Um, does any member of the public wish to comment on this item? A public comment. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the committee members? Member Morrison. Hi, uh, good to see you guys. Uh, I have a question. Uh, one of the things that uh, came up in the past was that non-employees unable to access the university's um, system because they didn't have the right email addresses and, and they couldn't log into stuff. Uh, have you got around that problem? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so we are using a secure uh, Google Drive for, for things that are not personnel related. And then we also have secure Dropbox that can be used through a linking system so that anything secure like uh, with you know, FERPA data can be uh, uploaded into a secure Dropbox. That's what our university has gone with. Thanks. Other committee members? Okay, this is an action item. Do I have a motion? Member Balatayo? I move that we accept the report and the recommendation of um, accreditation with stipulations to accreditation for 
uh, for this institution. Thank you. Do I have a second? I, I have a question. Is, is that the motion or is the motion to remove the stipulation? I, ju I just need some clarity. What are they asking for? I think it would be nice, and I, Cheryl can jump in if she, if she feels like she needs to, but I think it would be nice actually for the motion to include removing the stipulation and changing the accreditation status to uh, full accreditation. Just to be super clear, yeah. Thank you for the clarification. That again? Please. Okay, um, I move that we accept the report um, and remove all stipulations and change the institution's accreditation, accreditation status from accreditation with stipulations to accreditation for this institution. Thank you, Member Balotayo. Do I have a second? Okay, Member Hillis. Okay, we now do a roll call, roll call vote. Those in favor say aye, opposed say no. Secretary, please call the names. Cynthia Almas. No. Jomeline Bulatayo. Aye. Kathy Gracia. Aye. Joel Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Morrison. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee? Aye. Gerard Morrison? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Um, thank you, Dr. Hutton, Dr. Esposito, and Dr. Marisic, and Ms. Sullivan for your work on this. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we are, now we're, we're we're way ahead of schedule. Um, do we have our um, representatives from Pleasanton Unified School District with us, uh, Ms. Sullivan? Let me just double check. We also have, I think, item seven that we can go back to. Sorry, give me just one second here. Apparently closed. Aaron, we did out. item seven. We're good on item seven. I'm sorry. Was That's it okay. nine? Did we do nine as well? We, we, we did. did nine. Okay, and seven. we did. Yeah, we're all I apologize. Out. That's okay. <laughs> You, you are bringing people in. You're doing lots of things. I've apparently so missed it. Yes. Yeah, we okay. just have um, the only other items are the annual report and uh, stage five. So 17 and 18, if we need to start one of those, we certainly could do that if they're not available. I think we need to. Yeah, we do not have representatives here yet from Pleasanton. And we're right. we're 20 minutes ahead. So why don't we yeah. go on? Mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl, what, what would you recommend being the, the most timely item of those that you just mentioned, item 17? Sure. And I think 17, probably. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and move to item 17, which is the COA annual report to the commission. Uh, Administrator Cheryl Hickey will introduce this item. Uh, will you please begin? Yes, absolutely. And um, bear with me, my nine-week-old puppy just decided to wake up and cause havoc here. So I'm trying to, <laughs> to keep that quiet. Um, so this is the normal COA annual report that you um, approve every year. It is presented at the December meeting by the two co-chairs co of COA. Um, Dr. Anna Moore is not available um, from because this is backwards looking, but Marty Martinez has, has agreed to, um, to present with Bob Frelly at the December meeting. Um, this item, um, you know, uh, we're happy to take any additions, um, changes, um, we know that there's probably editing issues, um, so there may be typos and that kind of thing. Please feel free to send us any editorial changes, or grammatical changes, or you know, um, stylistic changes if you want um, it via you know an email to us. That is perfectly fine. We can clean up the document. Um, both Aaron and I were at CCTE last week trying to do this at the same time, trying to finalize this, and so I don't doubt that there are some sentences that don't make sense. So if that's the case, feel free to send that along. But we wanted to make sure that um, that we've covered sort of all the big topics. Um, this is always in three sections. Um, and if you go to the agenda insert, that's really where the, the report is. We'd like you to approve the report today with whatever changes, you know, so, so approve pending any changes that you, um, um, with the acceptance of any suggestions you might make. And just um, if you could 
trust that the, we could send the final version to both the, the two co-chairs right now for any, um, you know, um, changes or, you know, just to, to approve that we've caught everything before it goes to the commission in December. Um, so there are three parts to this. The first part, well, of course, there's an executive summary that summarizes what we did last year. And then there is um, a basic information about the variety of, of topics that we cover, things that we do, activities that we um, that fall under the umbrella of accreditation, and that is in the first section. The second section deals specifically with the accreditation decisions that you have all made, so the actions you've taken on site visits, on revisits, on provisional site visits, on um, um, you know transitions, on. Um, going inactive on uh, new program proposals. So that's all section two. And then section three is looking forward. It's sort of this, this academic year and what we're working on. So um, instead of you know, going line by line, um, we're happy to take any um, suggested suggestions you have and talk about whether this draft is um, something that you're okay approving with whatever changes you wanna make at this point in time. So I'm just open it up for for any of the comments that you all have. And especially if we've missed anything big, if there's anything that we talked about or discussed, um, because as you know, there's a lot that we deal with on an annual basis, so. And I wanna thank um, the co-chairs for the, the letter at the beginning. I'm trying to, trying to really capture what we, the sentiment of this year and last year and, uh, where we are in this unique point in time with um, COVID. I see Lynn's hand. Um, first of all, and I'm sure everybody feels this way too, It's this is a tremendous effort <laughs> to put into putting this report together, the hours that are spent writing it and gathering all that data and so on, just thanks to everyone who was involved in, in writing this. It was very clear and um, easy to read and so on. Um, the only question I had was on page 21, it talks about staff working to streamline the review process, um, which I appreciate having been a BIR member for, for many years. I'm wondering if it would be beneficial, and it may not be, so it was just the thought to mention um, briefly some of the ways that staff are considering um, streamlining the review process. Sure, we could, we could add a little bit of detail there. Um... Just to give the readers an idea of, of things that are being considered. Okay, we, we can certainly work with our, our staff on that. Um, I do want to thank you for reminding me. I do want to acknowledge Michelle Bernardo. Um, Michelle puts a lot of effort into this. So Michelle, thank you. Um, the whole section two, we start with section two because those are your findings. Um, and then we build the other two sections afterwards, but just really keeping track of everything through the year. Um, really critical, and, and she's the author of section two, if not all of it, so. Thank you, Michelle. I saw Member Morrison and then Member Frehley. Member Morrison? Actually, Lynn uh, said what I was going to say, so. Okay, okay. So page 21, we will um, add some examples of some of the th ways that we're streamlining. Member okay. Frehley. Thank you. And nothing specific since, Cheryl, we've already chatted about this, but uh, just for the whole committee, having gone through the presentations a couple of times now, um, they ask uh, very detailed questions and questions because they want to know what, what we do within the COA. And I think the staff does an a incredible job of representing our efforts and really their efforts as well uh, in preparing and, and sharing what we're doing with the processes is are and um, what progress has been made, what things we're still working on. Um, so again, some of the questions can be pretty challenging, but we feel pretty prepared to be able to go before them. And I know Cheryl, you've done that too. You've, Cheryl Forbes, you've gone up there on my behalf one time, I think it was. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely the effort. is a lot of effort. I think it's good effort because it gives us an historical uh, perspective and a record of what's occurred. So we can always look back to that, but it also helps present us in a good light to the uh, to the commission which is always helpful to get their support and, and strength in that so thank you to the staff for all the work you do on this thank you member Crowley. any other member comments or questions uh, member lee i was just going to add that as a as a newbie as the new guy just looking at the amount of work um 
that the staff has put into this. And really, for me, it was really an educational document because, again, it gave me this overview of, of prior to my arrival, the amount of things that are overseen and done. And so I appreciated it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Lee. It really is a testament to all that happened. Um, um, an amazing amount of work that that uh, that uh, all of you are able to accomplish in them. Um, very efficient, or at least uh, it may not always feel that from your end, but from our end, um, really efficient and organized process that's really supportive of the accreditation process for LEAs and IHEs. Um, um, anyway, so thank you. Member thank Forbes. You. Well, as a non-newbie, <laughs> um, I had many of the same reactions that Member Lee just expressed because I think you know, even though there have been many benefits to the um, being able to meet online like this uh, as a committee uh, during the pandemic, it's also been a little more disjointed in my experience. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and probably each one of us have faced our own challenges with attending or, you know, things that have come up this year in particular, these past year, these past two years in particular. So it was great to read everything put together in one place. It was, you know, kind of awe inspiring really as to both the responsibility that we have as a as a committee to make um, informed and impartial decisions, as well as the uh, scope of what it is we've been involved in, and you know having uh, had the opportunity to present the report one time to the commission, it's also a great opportunity to get kind of get on our radar what it is that they're interested in, right? You know, the particular members that are on the committee at the time, that, or I mean the commission at the time that you present it. So I look forward to that feedback. Thank you, Member Forbes. Other comments, questions? Member Frelly. Yeah, just one more, and that is just uh, recognizing that the report that you see is, is really indicative of what you, what we have all done as a committee. Right together, so it is a, a year long process, uh, and it's kind of overwhelming. But I just have to say, kind of impressive and deserving of a pat on everybody's back for all the efforts that you do on this, and all the reading, and all the prep, and all the thoughtful, uh, you know, thinking and decision making that goes behind this. Because that is what you know, you all, what we all do together here, and so it's impressive from that perspective as well. So just from a position as a, as a colleague and a co-chair and, and a committee member, just thank you for everything uh, that you do uh, and your efforts on this. It, it wouldn't be possible. Staff supports, we do our work, and it, I think together it's a great team. So thank you all. Thank you, Member Frelly. And also, I think um, just acknowledging all the volunteers across, you know, all the, the reviewers, et cetera, it is an amazing system that happens and uh, it really works well together. So kudos to, to everybody and a, and a shout out to all those out in the field who support this process. Yeah, great comment. We, we could not do any of this without our volunteers. I mean, just in program review that, you know, um, um, Aaron was talking about, I mean, that is, you have over a hundred programs and we need two people for each program. So that right there is a couple hundred people, plus everybody, you know, on the site visits and common standards review. It is an, an enormous um, and very t uh, um, committed group of people. So. Mm -hmm. And I think it really models that focus on continuous improvement across the system because folks volunteer because they, they want to learn, but they also want to support. And um, it, it just really is embedded in the system in a way I think that was really envisioned uh, back when we started streamlining and, and changing standards. So kudos to everyone. Uh, this is an action item. And so do I have a motion to accept the COA annual report uh, to the commission? Okay, Member Morrison. I move uh, we accept the reports with possible uh, edits uh, uh, to the commission. Okay, do I have a second? Member Larson, thank you for seconding. Okay, uh, we will now do a roll call vote. All those in favor say aye, opposed say no. Secretary, please call the names. Cynthia Almas. Aye. Jomeline Blatayo. Aye. Kathy Christian. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. George Morrison. Aye.
Okay, Great. motion carries. Um, thank you, everyone. Great. And if you do have any um, grammatical or editorial, if you could get them to me, let's say by, you know, a week from today, that would be great. Thank you, Cheryl and team. Um, do we, so we have about eight minutes until our time certain for item 15. Uh, do we have time to move on to 18 or do we have institutional representatives here? The representatives are here for item 15 now. Okay, why don't we go ahead and go back to item 15 then? Okay. Okay, item 15 is the discussion of quarterly of the quarterly report for Pleasanton Unified School District. Consultant Poonam Beatty will introduce this item. She is jo joined by institutional representatives Kim Ortiz, Director of Human Resources and of the Pleasanton, Pleasanton New Teacher Project, Mike Williams, Senior Director of Human Resources, and Laura, Laura Stang, Pleasanton yes. New Teacher Project Induction Coach, Leadership Team Representative. Uh, Ms. Beatty, will you begin? Yes. Good morning, committee members. Good to see you all again. Item 15 presents the report of the Pleasanton Unified School District's first quarterly report. Pleasanton Unified School District operates a teacher induction program. And back in March of this year, they hosted a site visit. The accreditation site visit report was presented to the COA at its June meeting. And the COA moved to accept the site visit team's recommendation of accreditation with probationary stipulations. And as part of the accreditation decision, the COA also required the institution to provide quarterly reports, and this one is the first. The first link at the top of the first page of this report is to Pleasanton's quarterly reports webpage that's on their accreditation website. So this is where Pleasanton's first quarterly report can be found. And then the second link on the first page of this item is to the site visit team's accreditation report as was presented and accepted by the COA in June. And then across pages one and two of this item, you'll see the 10 uh, stipulations that Pleasanton is required to address through these quarterly reports and also through the revisit that will be hosted next spring. And just to um, kind of ground the, or kind of remind uh, committee members of the themes that the team saw at the site visit. Uh, one of the themes was the need for data analysis as was required by Common Standard 1. So although data was being collected by the program, the team did not find a continuous improvement process at the unit or program level in which data was analyzed in a way to make modifications for program improvement. Um, the second theme was the need for resources allocated to the program, which led to the team's finding of not met for common standard one. And then the final theme was in regards to the support for education specialist candidates in the teacher induction program. So now that these themes have been revisited, I'd like to direct your attention uh, to pages three to six of this item. And this is where you'll find the overview of Pleasanton's plans and or actions that have been taken so far to address the stipulations. And um, a quick note, across these pages, you'll see the acronym PNTP, and uh, that stands for the Pleasanton New Teacher Project, which is the name of the district's induction program. And I briefly just wanna highlight three specific stipulations. So specifically under stipulation one, uh, you will see under Pleasanton's actions and evidence that an advisory team was established. So the first meeting of this advisory team was held on May 20th, and the members of this advisory team include mentors, district leadership, teachers, and IEG representatives, among others. And there you can see the dates for future meetings listed under the stipulation as well. And scrolling down to stipulation two, uh, the COA may recall that the unit monitoring, monitoring of the credential recommendation process was also an area of concern raised by the team. So there are now three credential analysts in the district that have their own respective caseloads. And two of these analysts are now CTC authorized submitters. And then the final stipulation that I'd like to highlight is stipulation number six, which is on page five. And um, program staff indicated that uh, there are currently better support systems in place to support the education specialist candidates. 
um, which includes how it is that the program specialists in the district collaborate with the program, which um, the representatives that are here today can speak to the COA more about. And as stated in the introduction of the item, we have representatives from Pleasanton Unified School District present with us today, including Kim Ortiz, the Director of Human Resources, and she's also the Director of the Pleasanton New Teacher Project. We have Mike Williams, Senior Director of Human Resources, uh, Laura Stang, who is a um, coach, mentor, and a representative of the leadership team. And we also have additional um, coaches from Pleasanton, from Pleasanton New Teacher Project present with us as well. Thank you for being here this morning. So they are all here to answer any questions that committee members may have about the first quarterly report and about Pleasanton's progress in addressing the stipulations. And in conclusion, the next quarterly report will be presented to the COA at its February meeting. And with that, I conclude this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beatty. Uh, we now invite institutional representatives to briefly comment on the report. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you for um, being here today and uh, listening to the number of different agenda items. But today we're here to highlight that we have been making progress with regards to the stipulations. And we are really proud that we have, I'm proud that we have our leadership team on the call there. Um, you can see the PNTP induction coaches and they have been instrumental in helping to um, bring to fruition the steps that we put in place to meet the stipulations thus far. So I just want to recognize them and thank them for being here, as well as the Senior Director of Human Resources, Mike Williams, who's here uh, supporting the team. And he has been an avid supporter of the program. Uh, even back in the day when he was a high school principal, he was our, um, was definitely a supporter of the work that we're doing. So a couple of key uh, areas. First of all, we uh, launched the advisory team, which was made up of 20 different stakeholders, including our IHE representatives with a special education focus, because we know that that is an area that we need to continue to strengthen. We've put some plans in place that um, have been outlined in this quarterly report and in the subsequent quarterly reports will detail those out. So that um, group will be meeting again on November 2nd, and that's when we'll be going over the continuous improvement model, as well as the stipulations, so that they're aware of um, what the stipulations are and our actions to meet those stipulations. So that was a big uh, area of focus. The second one, was of course to include this data analysis. So we have been collecting data, of course, from our participating teachers, which we no longer call PTs, but they're candidates to align with the language, our site administrators, and then our uh, leadership team and our coaching team, as well as our special ed um, colleagues. So that data analysis process is underway. The second big area is now that we're in the HR department, there's much more of a, a intentional connection around an understanding of induction as a whole. And we're very lucky to have three credential analysts who are um, committed and their understanding is growing. One of the actions that we've taken that will be recognized will be documented in the next quarterly report is that we're making site visits, one-on-one -on -one site visits. So the credential analyst and myself or Mr. Williams or Ms. Twisselman, who's not here today, we're meeting at each site to talk about uh, the role of the analyst. So we've really moved to a more personalized caseload structure so each analyst has five or six schools that they're responsible for, as well as different departments. More on that at another time. So we have our advisory team underway. HR, it, we're now very um, uh, connected, lots of happenings in the HR division. And then lastly, a 
tighter relationship between our special education colleagues and the induction program. We've been meeting with them twice a month as, uh, as well as collaborating on different projects, like creating a website for our new teachers with special ed resources. And my colleagues who are on the call can talk more of that. But those were kind of three big areas that we've made some progress and we'll continue to outline specific plans in our next quarterly report. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Um, how about other institutional representatives, Mr. Williams or Ms. Stang? The, the only thing I'd like to say is that we're excited to have uh, induction program back in the human resources department. It allows us to work more closely to support the new teachers uh, go through their process. The, the description that Ms. Ortiz had with our analysts, um, it has many folds supporting our human resources department, one of them being what she described, uh, but we're trying to make more of a supportive or customer service approach uh, with everything we're doing within human resources in an intentional way. So um, as, as she mentioned, the, the, the team, the induction coaches have been extremely supportive um, making sure all of our new teachers uh, provide all those all the little details that they're going to need going into their their new career uh, path. So we're excited about having our coaches within the human resources department, which has allowed us to be more collaborative uh, in supporting our school district as a whole. So really appreciate this opportunity and all the great work the team has been doing. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and thanks to the team. And um, at this time, does any member of the public wish to comment on this item? I would love to jump in. Oh, excuse me, please do. Okay, thank you. And share just a, a few of the things that we're doing right now. Um, three things I would love to uh, hit on would be our DOS meetings, uh, which, which we call the DOS and PNTP collaborative. The Kim alluded to those earlier, we meet twice a month and um, we, uh, are talking with the program supervisors and the teachers uh, that they're supporting, the special education teachers at the sites that we're supporting. And we're gonna be moving into, um, the next steps will be moving into triads with our specific teachers and those program supervisors, as well as, and I don't know if this is the time to start talking about um, site mentor, district mentors, but we're moving to actual um, mentors that will be supporting those new SPED teachers right to, directly at the site. So they're veteran teachers, special ed teachers who um, are uh, credential alike with our new teachers as well. Um, another thing that we have in place is um, Sarah, um, who is also on the call with us today, <laughs> has begun um, a website specifically designed for supporting um, SPED teachers and with a real focus on supporting the new SPED teachers that have a lot of um, our district processes um, in there and as well as uh, lessons and resources and strategies for um, new SPED teachers. But we're hoping that it will, it'll be a resource for the SPED department to be using with all their um, uh, special education um, educators. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's really great to hear the enthusiasm from each of you about the work that's happened and how it's really uh, enriched your program um, and that ultimate support to our new educators. So thanks to everybody. Um, at this time, are there any members of the public who wish to comment? No public comments, Marty. Thank you. Any questions or comments from committee members? Okay, this is an information action item. The committee, committee may choose to vote to accept the report. Do I have a motion to accept the quarterly report for Pleasanton Unified School District? Member Morrison. I move that the committee accept the uh, report from the Pleasanton Unified School District. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Member Lee. We'll now do a roll call vote. Uh, Secretary, please call the names. Cynthia Almas. Jomaline Balatayo. Aye. 
Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Bob Fraley. Aye. Mike Hillis. Aye. Lynn Larson. Aye. Marty Martinez. Aye. Jason Lee. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Um, thank you to our institutional representatives and um, congratulations on the good work you've been doing. Thank you. I would like to also thank our CTC commission staff, Poonam and Cheryl Hickey and the whole team for really providing the consult and just the open door policy for us to uh, think with as we continue to strengthen our uh, support system for all of our newest educators. And there's a lot of them statewide, as we know. Anyways, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and thanks, uh, Ms. Beatty, for your work on this. Appreciate it. Thank you. OK, do we have, um, moving on to item 16, do we have our institutional representatives from CSU Monterey Bay? We do not. OK. <laughs> Great. Do we have time then to move on to? Oh, I'm sorry. We are here. Okay. Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's Kathy. Yeah. I so forgot I when we're... I when I promote somebody, they kind of have that automatic panelist status for when they do. Okay. So um, also we... promote uh, Dr. Josh Harrower and Dr. Edge Dalla. There are reps here with me as well. I can do that if um, the co-chair wants to take up this item at this time. Oh. Yes, let's Just go ahead. Me. Let's go ahead and move on to item 16. So welcome back, okay. Dr. Draper Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Let's see. And William's already here. Okay. In just oh, one it, moment. It looks like our lead reviewer, uh, Judy Silva, is here also. She is, yes. And who were the additional people? I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, Josh, Josh Harrower and mm -hmm. Edward Jadala. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 16 is a report of the accreditation team to California State University Monterey Bay. Consultants William Hattrick and Iori Asamwani will present this item. They are joined by institutional representatives, Dr. Kathy Draper Rodriguez, Department of Education and Leadership Chair. Does anybody need to recruit, recuse themselves? Member Larson, thank you, will recuse. Okay, Mr. Hattrick, will you begin, please? Sure, good morning again, committee members. Uh, the virtual site visit for Cal State University Monterey Bay took place October 10th through 13th for their educator preparation credential programs. The department chair, program directors, faculty, and staff from CSUMB were very responsive to team requests for additional information related to their 10 credential programs and accommodating other needs of the site visit team. I would like to thank the institution for handling the Zoom interviews with virtually no glitches, and to my colleague, Iori, who provided invaluable support for this site visit. The team included several new reviewers who did an outstanding job reviewing their respective programs. And in addition to interviews, the team reviewed evidence provided uh, both before and during the site visit to determine findings on all common and program standards. I will now hand it over to our team lead, Judy Silva, for more information on the specific standards findings and the team's accreditation recommendation. Good morning, everyone. All right, so um, this visit happened just uh, like two weeks ago. This is the fastest turnaround I have ever participated in. <laughs> so that was very exciting, but it's all to the credit of the institution, of our CTC consultants, William and Iore, and the team who just did an amazing job um, of getting things done in a very timely manner, and of the institution for providing us with all of the different stakeholders for us to talk to also sort of in a timely manner. So it was a really a great visit. So I want to thank everyone involved in that. So overall, um, our our findings for accreditation were accreditation with stipulations is what we're recommending um, to this committee. Um, the areas of stipulations had to do with some standards that were met with concerns for the education specialist credential programs in mild to moderate and moderate to severe disabilities 
and in the uh, teacher induction program. So specifically, all the other common standards were met. Um, you know, there were a couple that had a little bit of inconsistency due to some of these stipulation areas, but overall we found that the common standards were met and standards for many, many, many other programs were also met. <laughs> So I can go through and enumerate those for you uh, if you want me to, but um, you can see them here as well. So our overall recommendation, um, based on the fact that the team found two of the preliminary ed specialist program standards met with concerns and two of the teacher induction standards that were met with concerns was accreditation with stipulations. We recommend that within a year of this action, the institution submit a written documentation to the team lead and the commission consultants documenting all the actions to remove the stipulations as uh, we kind of noted them and identified them. Um, so for the preliminary ed specialist credential programs, uh, we were looking for evidence that candidates experiences in their early uh, fieldwork experiences reflect the full diversity of grades, ages of students with disabilities. Um, as outlined in the authorization. And then secondly, shows how candidates will be assessed on the education specialist teaching performance expectations by an institutional supervisor um, trained to assess the education specialist TPEs. So we were looking for um, you know, more information relative to the assessment of the ed specialist TPEs. There was uh, excellent information on the degree to which the uh, universal, now we call them universal, in the 2014 standards or TPEs, you know, they were more general ed, more of the general ed components of those TPE. So we're looking for the special ed uh, TPE assessments. Um, for the teacher induction program, we're asking that they provide evidence um, that ensures that the ILP includes defined and measurable outcomes and opportunities to reflect on um, progress. And that the program has developed targeted ongoing training for induction mentors inclusive of all the requirements in program standard four. So I've been sort of listening to the meeting for a while and this seems to be a theme <laughs> of um, really supporting that training in the role of a coach or a mentor for induction uh, teachers. So, um, you know, it's something I think that a lot of us are really working on. And this institution, CSU Monterey Bay, we feel like they're gonna have no problem addressing these stipulations because they had, you know, some things that they talked about that they were planning to do. And I think in implementing a lot of those plans and looking at the impact of those plans, they're gonna have no problem uh, with their report next year and removing these stipulations for a decision of accreditation in the future. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, as usual, I really enjoyed my time on this site visit. I am a big supporter of the virtual site visit. <laughs> it really has allowed me to um, meet with lots of different people in lots of different places. And it seems to allow our teams to be pretty focused in their work as as long as the days are and as few steps as i get in in a site visit because i'm stuck to my desk most of the day it seems kind of worth it for the way we're able to really dig into and understand and the different people we get to talk to so thank you for these few moments to share with you and if you have any questions i'm happy to entertain them on behalf of the team thank you Ms. silva we appreciate your work and leadership um, at this time, we'd like to invite the institutional representatives to briefly comment about the visit. We remind you that this is not a time to dispute the team's report, but rather to provide us with any thoughts you had about the visit. Great. I, I would just reiterate everything that Dr. Silva just said about it went really well. Our, our staff here on campus made it go um, really smoothly, as well as working with both William and Iori, everything went really well. And, and, and Dr. Silva as a team lead was just really great, just positive energy. It's a really stressful time. And she just made it really clear that they were here to support us and, and make sure that our programs are go, doing what they need to do and, and can, can continue to improve. Um, I do see a note in the chat if um, our Dean has arrived. I don't know if someone can, can promote him as well, but I just wanted to say thank you. It was a great opportunity. I also enjoyed the virtual visit. We were a little unsure about it, have only done face-to-face -face in the past, um, but that, that's it. Thank you. We're, we're happy to 
we're happy to be done with it, to be frank. <laughs> Apologies Thanks. to your dean. I thought that I had admitted him before I stepped away a few minutes ago. So I did just now as well. We'll give him just a minute to come on in. Uh, welcome, Dean Chidala. Um Dr. Draper Rodriguez just commented and wanted to see if there's any comments you would like to make to the committee. Well, yes, I was here and I heard her comments and I agree 100%. Uh, especially Dr. Silva, I met with her and I appreciate her professionalism and the way, again, being a new dean to the system, I appreciated all the guidelines that were provided for me to, to help, you know, transition into this role. Uh, I'm very pleased with the results and I'm very pleased with the team and the way they were able to gather all the data, analyze the data and present the data that provided us with this review. So again, I, I thank especially the team that visited us. They were very professional and uh, the results are, are, are definitely something that we can work on and we look to improve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Jadala. Um, at this time, are there any members of the public who wish to comment on this item? No public comments. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from committee members? Okay, this is an action item. Do I have a motion from our committee members? Member Forbes. I move that we accept the team's recommendation with uh, accreditation with stipulations and a seventh year report um, for California State University Monterey Bay. Thank you, Member Forbes. Do I have a second? Member Hillis, thank you for seconding. We'll now do a roll call vote. All those in favor say aye, opposed say no. Please call the names. Cynthia Elmos. Chamaline Balatayo. Aye. Kathy Krisha. Aye. Cheryl Forbes. Aye. Paul Bradley. Aye. Nick Ellis. Aye. Marty Martinez. Jason Lee. Aye. Gerard Morrison. Okay, uh, motion carries. Um, at this time, I'd like to thank, um, sorry, I, I lost my place for just a second, excuse me. I'd like to thank Dr. Rodriguez, uh, Dean uh, Tadala, uh, Mr. Hattrick and Ms. Osamwanyi for uh, your support and for your work on this. Thanks everybody. Thank you very Dr. much. Dr. Silva, I think if didn't mention her. Thank you, and I did miss, miss uh, Dr. Silva. <laughs> Don't wanna thank forget you, Dr. Judy. <laughs> Excellence. And congratulations. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I believe we are on item 18. And item 18 is the discussion of possible options for refining stage five of initial uh, institutional approval. Consultant Poonam Beatty and Administrator Ellen, Aaron Sullivan will present this item. Ms. Beatty, will you begin, please? Thank you. Actually, I just accidentally kicked her out of the meeting. Hang on one moment. <laughs> I just removed my partner presenter. <laughs> Names shift around as we move people in and out, and sometimes I grab the wrong name. Um, while she's coming in, um, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and jump in on this. So um, Punom and I brought this item to the COA at its August meeting. Um, we had a couple of um, topics for you to discuss. There was some great discussion. Um, it wasn't a large representation of the COA at that meeting, and there was some desire for the COA members who were there to have staff bring this back again so that the larger body um, could discuss and provide some input to staff. So this is um, an information action item. Um, mostly what staff needs is to get input from you. Um, if you choose to take action at the end to sort of have staff move forward with any recommendations that you have, we can do that. So this agenda item presents some options for the COA on actions that it takes following provisional site visits with these institutions. Um, as we have been doing um, 
more and more provisional site visits. We've been taking a look at our own processes and finding if there are areas where we can improve this process uh, for staff, for the COA, and um, for the commission and for the institutions involved as well. So looking at the decisions um, that the COA is faced with uh, and the actions that it, that it has following an institution's provisional site visit, staff brought a couple of ref possible refinements before you at the August meeting. The first one, and the refinements are listed under the um, summary, uh, summary heading on page two of your item. So the first refinement was a suggestion by staff that perhaps the COA might like that their recommendation to the commission following a provisional site visit um, include um, one of the actions that the commission has to take. So um, as there was a little bit of discussion um, this morning, even around the Burton uh, site visit recommendation, the COA member said, and what exactly am I recommending? Am I recommending that we say that they should get accreditation if that's what we were doing? And then sort of what does the commission do with that? So we'd like to refine that. So it, I, I think so it makes a little more sense. So the COA would recommend to the commission that it has made a finding of accreditation, accreditation with stipulations, et cetera, and that it recommends to the commission that the commission take one of the four actions that it has available to it. So grant full approval, grant approval with remand back to the COA, um, keeping it in provisional status or denial. Um, and those options for the commission are listed in um, the final column of the chart that's on the last page of your item. So they're down there at the bottom, those four options. So the discussion of the members that were in attendance at the August COA meeting um, was uh, resulted in very positive feedback from COA members at that time that adding this additional sort of layer to the COA's recommendation to the commission made sense, um, that it will be helpful to the commission as it considers its own actions to have its appointed accrediting body sort of adding a little more, um, uh, adding a little more content to its recommendation about where these institutions should move after you've seen them following a provisional site visit. So of course, staff is open for those of you who were not here in August um, to provide us some additional feedback on that topic. Um, I wonder if it makes sense maybe for me to stop now and see if there's additional input while we're sort of on that topic because that's the, that, that seems like the easy one right now. <laughs> I, is it okay if I call on people, Marty? Okay. Thank you. Um, I Cheryl, that. I saw your hand go up and then Jerry, I saw yours. Okay, well, I was I was actually going to ask something about if institutions have any level of stipulations, but I think we're just talking right now about how our recommendation to the commit commission, which I struggled with earlier, would be worded, right? Yeah, so it's mostly the that the, the issue of what to do with institutions that have stipulations is in the second part of this item. And oh, great. We do okay. want some feedback on that, yeah. Member Morrison, your hand was mm -hmm. up. So, Aaron, uh, thank you for clarifying this because uh, I was under the impression that we did this already. I'm sorry, I, I thought that's what that's what we did, uh, and so I would support doing this because uh, I I thought we were doing this all along that we were making a recommendation like that. So, thank you. Okay, you're welcome, Member Forbes. Well, if I could just say one more thing about that then, because, you know, in my history on the COA, one of the issues that we've kind of struggled with is granting program approval as well, right? And so now with the, you know, in answer to, uh, or in response to what Member Morrison observed, there's a more refined process for the institution to get approval in the first place. And so I think that's what's changed what we do in terms of our recommendations when it's still provisional. I had to go back and reread some of the reports today because I kept thinking, now, what is provisional? Um, mm -hmm. You know, how, how does that change uh, our response to what we're doing? But I think it's a super important step to make sure that the institution really does have the capacity 
to put to to mount these programs because what we saw in the past is some of the institutions that seemed to struggle were ones that maybe should have had more oversight when they were still in the institutional approval phase much less before they start bringing forward programs for approval where we don't have as much information now we have a lot more information because of that provisional institutional process when we're looking at programs mm -hmm. so i think we had some of those today as well right yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it's it's come a little bit out of, you know, our, our first provisional site visit was to Larry um, and it was a great site visit. And Terry ran that site visit and we had, you know, our A team because it was our first provisional site visit. And so it was very easy. It was very smooth. And then as we're doing more of these, you know, every one of them can't be a slam dunk. Right. And so we're starting to look at what do we need to do to help these institutions be successful? Um, and how can we assist the COA and the commission in its own decision-making process? So, And it was Turlock, not to Larry, but they're both Sorry. LATs. <laughs> Sorry to Larry if you're listening. <laughs> yes, it was Turlock. I apologize. Okay. So, and just to be clear, by the way, these um, process changes, they have to be approved by the commission. So, and I should have led with that. So one of the things that we're doing here is getting the, the COA's feedback on would it like us to go with, forward to the commission and make these recommendations, but we have to get final approval from the commission. So um, it sounds like staff has the go ahead to move forward with recommending to the commission that we refine your recommendation um, following these provisional site visits to include possibly recommending to the to the commission what what it should do with these uh, with these institutions. Okay, so then refinement number two. Now this is at the bottom of page two. Um, for this particular one, so as I said, you know, our first provisional site visit to Turlock. Um, was a was a great provisional site visit, and it resulted in a recommendation by the team of full accreditation. Um, when institutions uh, go before the commission with a recommendation of full accreditation, or let's say denial, it seems pretty clear what the commission's decision is going to be. Um, they obviously can go, you know, whatever direction that they want to. That's their authority. But um, it's it's a more clear, I think, deliberative process for the commission. Now, where we have um, a spectrum of sort of gray area is when we have institutions that have um, one or more stipulations that are at a variety of levels. Um, these institutions in provisional site visit can come before you with the same stipulation recommendations as, um, as a, any of our institutions that are in a, a color cohort. So you could also be um, considering accreditation with stipulations, accreditation with major stipulations or accreditation with probationary stipulations. And because this body is, again, the accrediting body appointed by the commission, and you all have a lot of history in sort of teasing out what stipulations mean and what the weight of various stipulations might mean and how easily an institution could address one stipulation over another one. The um, staff started thinking that perhaps it might make more sense for the COA to have a discussion about um, possible changes you might like to see in this process when you do have an institution that has stipulations before it. So two of the recommendations that the, or I'm sorry, two of the decisions that the commission gets to make, again, um, bottom right-hand cell on that, on that chart on the last page on page four, Grant full approval, number two, grant full approval and remand back to the COA to address stipulations. Or number three, continue provisional status for a year to address stipulations. In both of those cases, the institution starts with you, goes to the commission, the commission makes a decision that essentially sends it back to you, and then you continue to work with the institution. Um, that's kind of a lot of back and forth between the two bodies. Uh, it's a lot for both bodies. It's also a lot for the institutions. And so staff was um, wanting to hear what the COA might think about um, potentially holding an institution uh, within its own purview until 
what amount of time it has taken to address the stipulations and then putting it before the commission um, when it has, again, these are open for conversation, when it has addressed all the stipulations, when it's addressed a sufficient number of the stipulations, um, you know, sort of what would you like to see there? And the questions to kind of guide you around this conversation are at the bottom of page three under the issues for discussion heading. Um, and I, much as I don't like to read items to you, I think they're just really well worded. So, you know, the first discussion point staff is interested in hearing um, feedback from you is, you know, would the COA hold all institutions that receive any level of stipulations? So anywhere from, you know, stipulations to probationary, or, you know, would it like to sort of carve out, again, um, different scenarios for it before it puts an institution forward? Or if one or more stipulations could be addressed in a short amount of time, this is bullet point number two, depending on the nature of the stipulations, you know, would the COA want to hold an institution back until it gets to a certain point and then put it before the commission? So there's a, there's a lot of movement here. There's a lot for you to consider. Um, and again, it would be recommendations that the staff would take before the commission to consider. Um, so with that, I think I will just make myself available, Poonam is here, here available, as well as Cheryl to answer any questions as you kind of discuss what makes the most sense for these institutions that have stipulations on them as they're in provisional status. Okay, see a couple of hands up. Member Hillis? Yeah, Aaron, was there an original rationale of why that moved from the committee to the commission to back? I'm just curious, like, Maybe there was a purpose in doing that that we're not aware of. You know, I, there, wa there wasn't, unless Cheryl can speak to that, because Cheryl was really one of the authors of this original process. But, um, you know, when we were originally sort of de defining this process, I think some of these, like, intricacies sort of had not presented themselves. Um, and again, because that first provisional site visit was, was so smooth, you know, it just it just moved right through. And then as we started seeing things with stipulations, then we started really recognizing that this process involved a lot of back and forth. Um, and I believe Cheryl had even said this was something that she kind of staff kind of always meant to get to. Um, and of course, you know, as soon as we had an institution in provisional status, it, you know, it, it, it put itself uh, front and center on our to do list. Yeah, I was so just going to no, add that. I was just going to add that, you know, the, the, the provision of approving an institution is in the, is within the authority of the commission, not the committee on accreditation, but you all have the expertise when an issue is found and how, like Aaron said, the weight of that issue, how easily it can be fixed. The commission does not have that programmatic level understanding to the depth I think that you all do. And so um, I knew I'll tell you, I knew personally that this was going to come up and that we, would, we were going to have to fix it or adjust it um, because that first one was a clean sweep. It was all standards met. It was fine. But, you know, these are new institutions. They are going to have issues, you know, what, as hard as they try or as wonderful, there's going to be something that might need fixing. And so you don't want the commission that's a policymaking body not knowing what to do with that information, which is why we said, okay, we're gonna bring it to the COA first. COA can say, yeah, this is what we would do so that at least they'd have that information. Um, but, but now we're talking about, you know, let's think about all the different various stipulations. You know, would the, would the commission, if you, let's say you came up with probationary stipulations, you had a lot of concerns about an institution in those first few years. So it's not just the routine, getting things mm. off the ground, but there are real issues there. As a commissioner, would I want to have, to be able to keep that in my purview and, and either deny or say, no, you know what, we're gonna you know, move this back to the COA or, or what, what involvement of the COA should, should come into play here? So, and that's all it is, is just figuring out what the nuances are. Um, and how this was going to play out. We, we did not have the opportunity to really refine this at the end, but we are now in that position where we have institutions in this stage. So it's all coming, coming full circle here. That's a long-winded answer, but yes. Yeah, it's good though. I think the history was great, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. 
Member Morrison. I think if, if, if there is some kind of um, recommendation for a, a, a modification of the process, we should differentiate between stipulations and probationary stipulations. I mean, we, you know, we've seen even today when uh, stipulations might mean some, some minor thing that they've already fixed before we even get, get to discuss it. Um, so I think that I, I would like to see, you know, not, not hold something up for stipulations in the same way we would for someone who we think is, you know, the whole program uh, needs to be looked at. So, yes, I think the general idea is right. Uh, but I would differ differentiate between the levels of stipulations. Thank you, Member Morrison. Member Almas? Um, I agree with uh, Member Morrison. I think that perhaps a differentiation between the types of stipulations, um, what type of stipulation would warrant what action. It shouldn't be like a one-size-fits-all. And then also... Um, do, what are the, like we had a case last year that kind of, I feel like triggered a lot of this and it went back and forth to legal um, before it came to us with a lot of, Terry read this entire legal recommendation on whether or not um, what we could do as a um, committee in terms of recommending accreditation. So I was just wondering do these recommendations take into account, has legal weighed in on these? Cheryl, do you want, so, I don't think this covers that situation. Okay. Um, that situation had to do with, if I'm thinking of the same one, had to do yeah. with whether an entity was legally able to offer a certain pathway. Um, Hopefully that will never happen again. <laughs> um, but this is this is sort of after the commission has approved it to be offering the program and after you have all approved the program to be offering. And they've been running for a little while, a couple of years, and they're running during this sort of trial period of time. Period. Yeah. And yeah, and now, okay, are we going to put them in the regular process? So any of the issues that had to do with legal last year were we're in the earlier stages. So that mm -hmm. would have been whether or not a program could be approved at all. This one is they're running, they're operating and have they shown enough performance that, that you know, that they're operating with capacity and with um, some success. So that being the case, I agree with uh, member Morrison. Okay. You know, I think it needs to be kind of more of a case by case. Okay. Thank you, member Ramos. Uh, any other committee member comments, questions? Okay, this is an information item or an action item. Um, Cheryl can, or Aaron, can you speak to um, what the next steps would be to, to maybe help us inform our next step? I think I need a little more before, because my next step or our next step would be to take something before the commission. And um, I, I need a little bit more input from the COA on, um, on the scenarios in which, so let me see if I can, how can I word this? Would you want the commission to consider allowing you to hold an institution under your purview until it has met all or some or a sufficient number of whatever stipulations it might have Again, as opposed to putting an institution forward with stipulations and then having it remanded back to you. And then, so what, what might be the cases in which you would want to consider, let's hold this institution now, we, and we can, let's think about, we can put them forward in six months. We can put them forward in a year. It gives the institution a chance to address the kinds of things, again, that this body knows are easily addressed. Mm -hmm. um, before they end up in front of the commission and the commission maybe sees 15 stipulations and thinks we should not be approving this institution, right? Um, so I think I need to hear a little bit more about what your thoughts are on holding those institutions back and sort of when and, and how that might look. And then I think what probably we would do, because this is, I think, really tricky, is um, 
try to distill what you would like done, put it in a writing because it would need to become um, part of a process. So put it in a process Mm -hmm. sort of format and bring it back to you again. So you can really look at the process and make sure it reflects what you want. Thank you, Erin. Um, and so as a committee, let's let's go ahead and provide that feedback to Erin and, and Cheryl, if we have it. Um, I see, remember, almost, uh, um, is your hand still up from last time or did you have a new comment? Okay, thank you. Uh, member Fowley and then Member Forbes. Sure, thank you, uh, Co-Chair Martinez. I, I agree that I think it, we need to be able to take a look at this and come up with some kind of um, consistent policy that we can apply with the stipulation so that it doesn't end up uh, becoming a back and forth between the commission and the COA. And as Aaron has been saying, it then leaves the institution in the middle of it, trying mm-hmm. to guess and then prolong the process, which mm-hmm. may not necessarily have to be prolonged if we can certainly address what needs to be done at the moment. So mm-hmm. it seems that we're looking at is what level of stipulations that you are asking that we want to come up with. Is that what your the basic question is? At what point do we want to uh, hold it within the committee to make the decision and work directly with that institution? And at what point do we feel we've done sufficient work to make a recommendation to the commission? You know, something along those lines or even maybe as simple, and it's up to you, you know, we'll have to think about what do we think the commission would approve or, you know, or frankly, don't worry about that. We can take them before they can say yes or no. But I mean, it could be something as simple as, you know, the COA would like to be granted the authority to Mm -hmm. retain under its own jurisdiction an institution that has stipulations until such time the COA feels that an institution is ready for approval or it's done all it can to address the stipulations. And at that point, it should Mm -hmm. just discuss what's left with the commission. So it could Mm -hmm. be something that sort of general. And then you can work out the details of at what point do you hold an institution back sort of um, separately, perhaps. It makes perfect sense uh, to be able to handle that internally. Um, and I, the question would then become is, as do we have sufficient time to discuss the details now? Or you want just a general recommendation from us as far as saying we believe that it would be more beneficial for the entire process if we were to do X, Y, and Z. And then goes back to you, you work on the wording in the next meeting, we take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Member Forbes, go ahead, excuse me, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, so if there are some details, even if you're not sure about them, if there are some thoughts you have about, I might want these details in there, um, let me know, I'm taking notes and I'll do my best to tease that out. Okay, I'll allow some of the other committee members to chime in, then if if I need to, I'll come back in with some thoughts. Member Forbes. You're on mute. Um, So looking at the issues for discussion and the item on page three, I think those are pretty good questions to help us start to craft what we would like to see, right? So Mm -hmm. it said, would the COA hold all institutions that that receive any level of stipulations? And I think what I've heard so far is the answer is no, in the sense that stipulations, um, say for example, kind of what we just saw with just a seventh year report, those are not ones that we would necessarily recommend holding, but major and probationary are, right? So I guess one question I would have about that is, say, for example, that um, the previous institution had been uh, probation, had been provisional. So would then the commission monitor that seventh year report or that you know, there's there's no major stipulations. It's uh, another report that's going to be made in a year. So at that point, is that something the commission itself, they would take that report back to the commission, not to the COA. That's just a question that I would have. It is, and it's a good question. I think that because the reports indicate that, so a site visit report that included the team's call for a seventh year report. If the COA was to approve that, I believe that seventh year report then comes back to you. So that's sort of automatically built in already. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't necessarily mean that the institution would stay in provisional status. 
No. So that's so the, the commission currently can either approve, you know, with with some with some. Um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm sorry, my brain just went blank. So they can basically either approve or deny. And there can be some contingencies on their approval um, that include ongoing involvement by the COA, but it's approve or deny. So they actually don't have the authority to hold an institution in provisional status for a longer period. Once, once it goes before them, they have to say yes or no. So an institution sort of remaining in provisional status seems to lie with this body. If this body wanted to hold on to an institution until it addressed uh, stipulations to a certain level. So the commission can't hold them in stasis. Right. So in essence, we'd be saying then any institution that had stipulations, unless they were major or probationary, would go on to the commission. We'd want to sort of be confident that um, that that degree of oversight would be sufficient and that that would be successful for the institution, right? That they would be likely to succeed and be approved instead of denied if that's what we had already agreed was the um, appropriate action. In other words, it wasn't major or probationary. Um, so I think the answer to the second bullet in that would be, yes, there's a difference in the answer depending on the level of the stipulation is what I've heard so far. And kind mm -hmm. of my sense from having been on the in the COA for a little while. And so the second bullet, um, the second dark bullet, as opposed to the clear bullet, um, if one or more could be addressed in a short amount of time, that would to me kind of necessarily imply that it's not major or probationary. Because what you know, if something could be addressed reasonably in a short amount of time, it probably wouldn't be a major or a probationary stipulation. That could be the case. Major stipulations sometimes could arise just from the sheer number, with some of them being really severe. Um, so some of them could get addressed in a in a short amount of time. That you know, the easy ones, the the, the sort of low hanging fruit, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that could be a situation for major probationary is likely that all the stuff that there's a great number of stipulations and they're severe and or there are just some really severe stipulations. So I'll just stop after this last sentence. So mm -hmm. it, it, just what I think I've heard so far and my own opinion would be that we not uh, that we do we ask if we can hold um, mm -hmm. institutions that would receive major or probationary stipulations, knowing that we could accelerate the major stipulations people perhaps, or institutions, mm -hmm. if they, you know, came back in a reason, you know, a shorter amount of time, it wouldn't necessarily mean they'd be for a whole year. You know, it would depend on what the action of the COA was in the ensuing time. But it, so that the only ones that we would, you know, not ask to hold would be those that we agreed were stipulations but not major or probationary so that makes sense i have that written down and it might be again this is another detail i don't want to sidetrack everyone but it might be for these provisional institutions that um a seventh year report not ever sort of be the case because they're in provisional status maybe any level of stipulation should require some immediate follow-up some quarterly you know reporting back because because they're brand new institutions and they, they just might need that, you know, additional sort of push to get these things addressed. So Erin, oh, go ahead, Member Hillis, I see your hand. I was just going to say that, um, and I know it's different in terms of provisional versus the full accreditation decision, but it seems like if we use that uh, same language of the major stipulation or probationary stipulations that we're, that's what we're using to the commission, making sure that they understand what it is that we're kind of landing on in terms of holding back. Um, because in that way, it seems like it'd make a more consistent uh, process to the commission of why we're actually asking for this. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay. So I also have a question. So, you know, uh, Member Forbes and Member Hill has kind of just outlined a possible direction we may head. And so say if we were going to hold back, if you will, with the CA with those major and uh, 
probationary stipulations, what would then be the requirements on our end? Would we have to change our protocols or anything like that on our end about how we conduct business or move institutions along? Thinking about that too, will we have to update the COA's um, um, procedures manual? Mm -hmm. That's what probably, I mean. probably, I think, um, just to make sure it's clear, right? And then we have all of your policies and processes like in a very clear, clearly delineated document for folks. So, yeah. And, and right now, um, let's see, go ahead, um, Member Forbes. And uh, so that just also made me think about the, I'm sure that the directions to the BIR teams are different for those conducting a probationary visit as well, right? And so, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm thinking of what I call the green sheet, and I know it was emailed out this morning. Um, you know, it seems like maybe we would need a, either a version of that that was for a probation for provisional institutions or okay. to embed that language about provisional institutions within the same green sheet. Perfect. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Cheryl and Aaron, you know, kind of with the feedback you've had thus far, do you feel like you have enough to maybe draft the next version that we could revisit at our February meeting? I, I think I do, but let me repeat back to you just in case it triggers some additional feedback from anybody on, on, on this committee. So what I've heard from those of you who have um, provided input is that the CUA should consider um, uh, asking the commission if it would be appropriate for you all to hold on to institutions that receive major or probationary stipulations until such time as you deem that the institution has at least gotten itself to maybe just stipulations, um, and then you would put them forward. I, I'm wondering if you have an idea of um, how much time you think would be allowable for an institution. Are you thinking a year? And are you thinking that you would want to include the, the, the detail that the institution would remain in provisional status for that year. So I'm just trying to fill in on these little detailed and just pieces. on that, I think I'm glad you raised that, Aaron, because I don't think it should be an open-ended thing. I don't think the commission will go for an open-ended. No, I don't either. <laughs> I think it has to be not to exceed a certain, whether that's a year, which I think a year probably sounds fair, but you know, you all can decide on that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that will give them some assurance that hey, if they don't get it together, we have that option to deny. And it it adds that little um you know, the stick and the carrot kind of thing, you know. And to me, it seems like um, just with that, just the way you both phrase that right now, it, um, to me, it, I think it makes, it strengthens the process. So by the time it goes to, to the commission, that mm -hmm. they have a much better idea for, like, for example, an institution on probationary stipulations that maybe, yes, they, they were able to, to get together with the support from the COA and the, and this, and the staff um, or not. Um, mm hmm mm hmm and um, okay. and so if we said a year, you know that not to exceed a year, we we have the um, the the opportunity to speed it up as well, right? To mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as the quarter reports come in, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for saying the quarterly reports. I'm I'm wondering is the COA generally in agreement that the the process I write up should include that. An institution in provisional status should not be allowed that option of a year report. It should be, they should be quarterly reports because they're provisional. Okay. I think we'd want to see updates fairly regularly, right? That they're making progress towards that ultimate goal. Okay. I see lots of heads, heads uh, shaking them. Uh, member Amos okay. and Member Frelly. Uh, member Amos. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I just wanted to agree with Cheryl and Aaron and the wording. And I think a year is good because it gives, you know, major and probationary stipulations are very serious. And mm -hmm. oftentimes the first fix is not gonna work. Um, and so sometimes institutions, um, or my experience, you know, doing the reviews is that institutions 
oftentimes we'll propose something and then they have to go back and refine it and retool it. And so I think if we hold on to them for, um, for that year and they do the quarterly reports, then there will be evidence that um, what they're doing is um, really effective and, and really addressing the, the stipulation. Thank you, Member Ramos. Member Crowley. Uh, Cynthia, you stole my thunder for the most part. Well stated. Um, I do think that having the year is a great option, and we can it can even be briefer than that, like you mentioned, if if uh, it comes to that point where there's some significant progress. But by hold, having the quarterly reports, it not only holds um, the institution accountable, um, uh, it's also supportive for them as well. So that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. key. Part of the right. process, yeah. So I would support that. And I, I think I have maybe one last question, which is at the end of that year, because I think what we have right now is not to exceed one year. At the end of that year, does the institution go before the commission regardless of the status that it's in? Okay. I think they have to. I think so too. I just wanted to be clear. I'm already thinking about the policy that I'm going to write up and I want to get all those details in it. So um, and what, without, I might throw, what I might throw yeah. in the mix of this is that an institution in that you've deemed is major or probationary that you're holding a provisional is we might make it explicit that they're not allowed to offer or propose new oh. programs. Okay. I think that's a good point. I would, I would support that. Member this would be in line with what you have done in the past. Yeah. Okay. Member Crowley. Yeah. And thank you, uh, Coach Chair Martinez. Yeah, Cheryl, that's exactly what I was going to say as well. I think that's a good point. Um, and I would say that it, the, the institution can, the report can immediately go to the commission with the provision that we already will have looked at it. By, and I don't know how to word it in such a way so that it doesn't go across to the commission as if, well, the COA could have looked at this and could have prevented some, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, for somewhere sure. that, that's an option, um, but it will go forward only after it's been reviewed by the COA. So it's just not an automatic, but that there's no longer than one year time frame. Is that kind of what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And even after, yeah. And I think the fact that um, requiring, for instance, quarterly reports and these kinds of follow-ups that will give staff um, something more to bring to the commission when it finally does bring one of these institutions. There'll be all of this history about, you know, this is where they were, this is what they've done to address these things, you know, so. Yeah, reflect the opportunities, the challenges, and all the steps along the way to get to that. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so I have a question as well. So, you know, if we were, if we required, so for example, an institution had to do four quarterly reports because of the work and, and our recommendation, does that affect the one year timeline? So say we get to that one year with the fourth quarter and then considering the next commission meeting, um, does it have to, I mean, would the year include be included in those four, four quarters and then it waits for the next commission meeting? Do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying and timing is really tricky between this committee and the commission. So um, I think we'll wanna be very clear that it's one year maybe not from the site, but like this is something to be teased out. Is it one year from the site visit or is it one year from the time that the COA sees the institution for the first time? Because sometimes there's four months in between, you know, if you have an October visit and the institution doesn't come to you until February, um, it's possible that the COA might be able to make that determination because again, as you've seen, sometimes an institution I wouldn't say sometimes, most of the time, when you have an institution who's had four months between their visit and their COA meeting, they've already taken some action. Mm -hmm. Rarely that they come before you and say, uh, you know, we haven't been doing anything for the last four months. We are <laughs> waiting for you. Usually they come and they're like, we've already done these things. Mm -hmm. So does that mean then that you would want that year to start with their, uh, with their site visit or with their um, appearance before this body? Um, and I'm wondering if the year should start with the appearance for this body just to give us that time in case there's those those challenges that, that they're not able to meet. And if they come prepared and, and like most do with those changes, you know, already underway, 
then that would help us, I think, speed up the process. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would just jump in. I would just agree with it, with Marty just said. And I think um, having it in such a way so that the institution knows that they will have done some work ahead of time, but that because it is adjusting based on the schedules of all the different committees and so forth, that uh, and it might be when they come before us that we say, you know what, you've done some significant work, so maybe this is the time frame, but it's all really contingent on when the, co the commission is going to be meeting so that they can't be, uh, I guess they understand they're not expected to go before the commission unless they've had a couple of solid quarterly reports that we've been had a chance to review. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, good point. Okay. Uh, Member Amos. I was just about to take my hand down because I agree with um, you and Member Frawley. Um, I think from the time they come to us, that'll give them a running start and um, hopefully um, we they can kind of fast track to at least get to the stipulations before the year so they can go before um, or move on. Well, you stole my thunder, th thunder Cynthia. It's only appropriate I steal yours. So, <laughs> okay, Bob. Okay. Member Larson, or do you have anybody's thunder to steal? Uh, hopefully not. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I just wanted to say that I I agree completely with the year starting. You know, with the presentation to the committee on accreditation, it does give them a running start, and we're not saying they have to stay in that status for the year. It. Um, so I don't think it penalizes anyone in, in any way. Thank you, Member Larson. Any other comments or questions? Okay, this is an information or action item. Um, um, I would recommend that we keep this information and that um, knowing this will come back in February um, and with a, a more refined um, narrative of, of what, what this might look like. Does anybody have any uh, questions or uh, opposition to that? Okay. I just want to acknowledge Poonam and, yeah, and uh, the, IP, <laughs> the, the IPR team that has brought this forward, Hart and, and, and Michelle Williams, George and others. Oh, IIA. The IIA, IIA yeah. and IPR, yeah. yeah. You know, mostly IIA. And, um, you know, just bringing this item forward and kind of pushing the envelope to make us think about this. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And actually, if, if I may, I know we're wrapping up the conversation, but just for this is a point of clarity. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the COA members for discussing this and being um, there with our partners with us, with us on this. In regards to the major informationary uh, stipulations piece, it feels as if there is agreement that the institution should remain with the COA. So in regards to an institution with accreditation with stipulations, is that more of a case-by-case -case basis, or would that still be a, uh, would the COA still feel comfortable moving that institution forward? I just want to make sure that there's clarity on that piece, whether or not they're remaining with the COA or is accreditation with stipulations a case-by-case -case basis? Hmm. It's a good question, Pam. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering, does that affect the system in terms of the BIR reviewers to really be clear about what each of those levels mean and, and kind of what I, I feel like we are, but there's always that ambiguity. Um, mm -hmm. um, will that create challenges um, or should we keep it all with us if it's anything but accreditation, knowing that we can have the opportunity to move things forward um, at different rates, depending on the, on the kind of that context that each institution has. I don't think it changes. I'm trying to think of BIR members on a site visit. I don't think that changes whether you hold it or whether it goes to the commission. I don't think that changes their perspective. I think that that part will stay consistent. Um, you, of course, that is just a recommendation to you all, as you know. You always can change the accreditation finding. Um, so I think I think you're okay there, in terms of whether it impacts the reviewers. I don't think it. I don't think it will. I don't know. Maybe 
Erin or Pranam has it. Yeah, I don't think it will either. I don't think it should. Maybe yeah. that might be a better way of saying yeah. it. I don't think they should be thinking about where will this right. institution go afterwards. We want them to be thinking about what's the best, mm -hmm. most logical decisions that they should be making based on alignment to the standards. And staff will worry about <laughs> yeah. where the institution goes after that and supporting them. I see member Amos's hand up. Yes. Sorry. You know, this is a question that I've been grappling with for like two years, this whole stipulations thing. And I agree with Cheryl and Aaron that at having been a reviewer, you know, the triangulation is kind of what the triangulation is, which leads mm -hmm. to the recommendation, right? So, you know, I'm not really concerned about that, but you know, as a member of the commission, do I want to recommend um, a program, a new program that has stipulations, you know, for, a, you know, to move on to be granted accreditation by the commission, you know, and I think that some of the issues that we're seeing now uh, with some of our programs um, being reviewed are the manifestation of, of there being, having been problems in the past, stipulations in the past, and they've kind of been dealt with and then removed, and then here we are again, you know, which kind of led to why I voted on some of the things that I voted on today. And I have some questions um, that I really wanted to have like an offline conversation with Aaron and Cheryl about at a later date, but sooner than later. So, you know, with all that being said, as a member, I think we should ask ourselves, you know, that question. As a body, are we comfortable um, recommending a new program with stipulations move on? Well said, uh, Member Elmas. Thank you. Uh, member Forbes? Well, I, yes, I think this is a really important conversation. And I know when we meet in person, we usually have a debriefing. And I have to say, I've missed the debriefings, you know, when we have an opportunity to, to have these kind of discussions in a little bit more um, depth. But uh, I think, too, it's super important to differentiate. Like, this is the provisional process, right? So by definition, there shouldn't have been ongoing problems, as we see in institutions that have already been approved, because this is the pr provisional institutional approval, not a program approval, right? I mean, the program approval, you know, comes before the site visit, correct? Because you can't be implementing a program, but, but you know, by, by having this ability to provide more oversight to those institutions, those provisional institutions, we might prevent the problems that member almost is, I, you know, highlighting that occur later on after an institution's already gotten that um, approval to operate as an institution. Because uh, it's a lot, I think it's a lot more um, compelling to the institution, uh, thinking of the, you know, infrastructure that needs to be in place if they're not going to be approved to offer any programs uh, you know even more so than when there's one program that might be needing a lot more attention so you know anything that even though I'm sensitive as an institutional program sponsor to the amount of time that they might be in this provisional world I, I'm, I'm not so sure that we'd want to have any stipulations that would go automatically to the commission Okay. So I think I'm agreeing in essence with what member almost was, what I so am perhaps, interpreting from, you know, member Amos's comment. So I think what I'm hearing is at least so far, and again, you'll have an item that you can, you know, provide additional input on, but I think what I'm hearing so far is that generally uh, there seems to be agreement that if it's major and probationary at 100% stays behind. Uh, if it's just, accreditation with stipulations that the committee wants to have the option to assess what those stipulations are and perhaps move an institution forward or not, depending on what they are. Because again, also thinking about the timing between your meetings, there may be time also for that institution to address some of those things before they land in front of the commission as well. So 
Um, there are certainly some details to, to present to you at the time you're making these decisions about, you know, when they could go before the commit. Like we could add some more information for you to assist in those decisions um, going forward. But I think that's what I'm hearing. So major and probationary are, are a hard stop. Anything else stipulations is the committee would like to have the authority to determine whether or not to move it forward. Right. And also just, I would like to say, and to, to give again our IIA team a nice little plug, um, I'd like to respond to some of what member Forbes just said about supporting these institutions. So one of the other modifications that we've done at a staff level is to um, just make some determinations about how we could better support these programs after they're made provisional, because after they come before you and they get their program approval, we've let them kind of go out and operate. Um, and um, we've seen in our own assessment in this last year that maybe a few more touch points with them could help them be successful because they're putting out candidates. So we want them to be successful. So um, the IIA team has um, created some additional supports to that they'll be providing to these institutions throughout their provisional time that hopefully will help them just stay strong um, through, throughout their whole provisional period. Okay, I see Member Hillis. Yeah, I, I just wanna uh, support what others have said. Um, I was actually, um, Cynthia, what you had talked about, um, that was also in the back of my head. And I was, I was trying to think of it, um, I think more from, if I'm sitting on the commission and I'm thinking about new programs, provisional, programs, um, it does seem like I would want everybody to start at a certain level and uh, that when they're coming up with stipulations, whether they're minor, major, probationary, whatever, um, again, I'm not on the commission, you know, but, but if I was, I think I'd be saying, you know, everybody should start um, on first base, um, and not halfway to first base. And um, it, it just seems to me more logical uh, in that way when we're talking about provisional. I understand why we would want stipulations later on as programs are making changes and you know through the years and, and whatever, but, but we're talking about this, this new status, right? The, the provisional status where they're getting up to offering that. And so, um, so yeah, I, I would support what we've been talking about. Thank you. You said it much better than I. <laughs> okay. Um, Aaron, Cheryl, Padam, do you feel like you have enough information now? Yes. I think this has been a good discussion. Really good it discussion. Has mm -hmm. Yeah. It has. Um, I just want to thank um, the whole the whole team, CTC team, and also the IAA team and just the, the committee for such a, a, a rich discussion. And uh, this moves us to item 19. Item 19 is the public comment. Does any member of the public have anything it wishes to say? Please remember to use the raise hand icon or if you are joining via the, via the toll free number, press star nine or your phone to inform, on your phone to inform the meeting moderator that you would like to speak. The moderator will inform you when it is your turn to speak. Do we have any comments from the public? Showing no comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, having no further biz business, I adjourned the October 2021 meeting of the Committee on Accreditation. The next meeting of the committee will be February 3rd and 4th of 2022. As a reminder, there is a chance that this February, February meeting may be in person, so be watching for staff notifications to COA members. Even if the meeting is in person, there will be options for members of the public and institutional representatives to join via technology. These same flexibilities will likely not apply to the members of the committee. Staff will update us all as they know more. And uh, at this time, we'll adjourn our meeting. And I'd like to thank everybody for your participation and uh, dedication to the work of accreditation in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much, everybody. everybody. You're all everyone in trouble. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Sure. Bye. 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 Yeah, see you next year. Yeah. <laughs>